The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, October 12th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. It's Casual Friday, folks. Joining us on the program this week, Heather Parton or Digby from the blog Hullabaloo and Salon. Also on the program today, Straight from his eBay page, Matthew Film Guy will be joining us ostensibly to give us a film recommendation for the weekend. He will also on the program, Turkey claims to have audio and video of the Jamal Khashoggi killing, and they have apparently shared it with the U.S., NAACP to sue uh, Brian Kemp, Secretary of State of Georgia, in his vote rigging plan for his own election. Convenient that. Meanwhile, Chuck Schumer does it again. 15 Trump judges get a free pass. You're going to lose so much, you'll get uh, sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, Democratic governor's uh, races looking pretty good in Ohio and Wisconsin. And Georgia and Florida are within reach. Court case reveals uh, that Bannon and Kobach added that census question to intimidate immigrants. 11 people dead in the wake of Superstorm Michael. And a climate change denier confirmed to lead the DOJ's environmental division. Meanwhile, Melania Trump, Kanye West battle it out for the most bullied person in the world. Very bullied. And a reminder, our immigration policy is tantamount to terrorism. All that and more on today's program ladies and gentlemen uh yes uh casual friday i am sitting here i am wearing a soft collared shirt and uh zumbas today wow. yep i'm feeling very cash and uh so i, I wonder <laughs> if people i guess everybody else is feeling a little cash around here too um uh another week ladies and gentlemen of uh and things get um, insane you know we were talking before and we're not going to go into this too much but we were talking before the program of uh, what's going on in Brazil and uh, Bolsonaro's uh, folks there was a protest what, what was the protest called it was a not him protest not him protest it was a week get, before the election and, and this was the election of course that uh, is not the final election, but the one that is going to lead to the uh, runoff. The first round, yes. And uh, there was a uh, protest, not him, basically saying, hey, this guy's fascist. We don't want him here. And specifically a misogynist. It was woman, uh, it was sort of, it was woman-centered uh, mass demonstration of all people, but with a focus on his misogyny. And so you had a lot of very sort of, I don't want to say banal, but typical uh, uh, women coming out looking like school teachers and moms and neighbors and, you know, uh, doctors. And it was not designed to look provocative or counterculture. Right. It was. Uh, yeah, we it was looking trying to look normie, I guess would be the word. And um, apparently, uh, I don't know who it was, Bolsonaro's people. Uh, 
put out pictures of a different protest called what were they fem- well they do it and we don't know it's it's the it basically they disseminate it through these whatsapp groups um and so it's people who support bolsonaro it could it seems like tactics definitely that you know bannon's certainly at least connected to bolsonaro's son bolsonaro denies that bannon advises him but you know whatever there's a connection there and they picked images from i think it was femin is it called but basically those are pro they were popular it was a big thing a couple years ago women from eastern europe who would go and protest events naked there was also other pictures that they had just of like you know public like like uh women like making out and stuff in public things like that and they sort of blasted it across these networks and said these are the not him protests and uh, so it's just uh you know on some level a a silly uh campaign of disinformation on another level, a very effective uh, campaign. And we see this uh, increasingly in, you know, Fox News, where there's a lot of times where they put out a mistaken picture of like, oh, these are the protests, and it turns out, no, those are not the protests. Um, Or, I mean, they do this often, and I don't know that they do it in a concerted way or if it's just an accident. We don't know. I mean, it's odd that it continues. But broadly speaking, we are... There is, I, I have a sense anyways that we are entering into an age where this is becoming uh, more of a problem in this country where uh, the ignorance of people and we have a, a video by uh, Paul Ryan just talking about Medicare for all, which I think um, is in some ways a, a, a similar tactic. And, and certainly I think, you know, there are when you have a situation where the secretary of state of a state like Georgia disenfranchises tens of thousands of voters for an election that he's running in. Or when you have a Supreme Court that um, refuses to hear uh, an appeal to a ruling by a court dominated by Republicans that will essentially throw an election in North Dakota, very, very possibly. And there's just no there's no recourse. It's just one of those things that it's just I don't know. It's um, it's a scary time. Very scary time. Yeah. Can I just read you two things that this fucker said? This Bolsonaro guy. Uh, sure. Uh, he said to a woman representative in Congress, I'm not going to rape you because you're very ugly. Yes. Uh, he also said, I'd rather have my son die in a car accident than have him dating a guy. Right. So, really so there's that women and that gay children should be whipped. I mean, well, so know, there was clearly impetus for the, that, that protest. But uh, the idea being um, is uh, is really more about the ability right. to reinterpret for people who are. Um, you know, for the average voter to reinterpret what the reality of any given protest is. Uh, oh, oh, this is good. So uh, it's been a while since Eero advertised on this um, on this program, and I'm not sure if it's not because I have been continually uh, pushing Eero to friends and family. And maybe, I don't know, maybe they saw like, wait, why are we still getting all these uh, links from the uh, majority report code? The Eero home Wi-Fi system brings you fast, reliable connection in every room of the house. Second generation Eero and Eero Beacon allow you to build a Wi-Fi system that's perfectly tailored uh, to the home uh, more than any ever before. In my apartment, I would come in and I would get in some of my rooms, I would c- connect to my neighbor's Wi-Fi more than mine because it was so weak until I put my Eero in. When you add Eero Plus, you get a total network protection with the ability to block malicious, unwanted content across your entire network. By checking the sites you visit against a database of millions of known threats, Eero Plus prevents you from accidentally visiting malicious sites without slowing anything down. Eero Plus automatically tags sites that uh, contain violent, illegal, or adult content so you can choose what your kids can and cannot visit right from the Eero app. Myla does not appreciate the fact that I shut down. I can shut down through my Eero app. 
I can shut down any device that she regularly uses. So her computer, her phone, they shut down at a certain time at night, and all of a sudden she has no Wi-Fi. It's like you're the NSA. It's true. I am her personal NSA. You can also get rid of annoying Absolutely. ads and pop-ups on all your devices. Ad blocking improves load time for heavy ad sites. You can browse and stream faster than ever before. Uh, I love, I, honestly, I love my Euro. I've uh, pitched it to multiple people, multiple people, uh, apartments. I mean, I don't know that many people live in houses, but I would imagine in a house, it's even that much more needed. Um, the app is great. I can see all the devices that are on uh, on the Euro, and like I say, I cut my uh, my daughter's access, and it's it's sort of fun. Uh, get 100 bucks off the Euro base unit in two beacons package, and a year of Euro Plus by visiting Eero, e -E -R -O, dot com slash majority, entering code majority at checkout. That's Eero, e -E -R -O, dot com slash majority, and code majority at checkout. Also, one of today's sponsors is newsvoice.com slash majority. Look, we have uh, increasing concentration of media. We all live in these epistemological bubbles where we only get uh, the media that we self-select by uh, via tw Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is. There's a new media company that's come up with their own response to these problems. It's called News Voice. It's an app for iOS and Android. You can access it for free if you go to newsvoice.com slash majority. And it gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating a mix of mainstream media sources, international sources, and independent media sources. Multiple sources are provided for each news story, left and right. The entire app is fueled by crowdsourcing. You can upvote stories you think are important so uh, people will see them. You can add stories to the app or you can add a source that's missing for a story. It's meant to be a completely open and democratized news aggregator that lets you get every side of every story. They also have a video interview series featuring guests from like Chris Hedges to AOC. Go download the app for free at newsvoice.com slash majority newsvoice.com slash majority if uh, you're watching uh, via YouTube put the link under this video and of course we put the uh, link in our podcast description as well and finally folks just a reminder Casper is a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time they have three mattress models the original Casper the wave the essential Casper mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And it is delivered right to your door in a small how-do-they-do-that size box with free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. Free shipping. The best part, of course, of Casper is that you get to sleep on your mattress for 100 nights. Totally risk-free. You sleep on it, you don't like it, send it back. No, thank you. After all, you spend one-third of your life sleeping. You should be comfortable. Uh, folks, you know I am also uh, the proud owner of multiple Casper uh, mattresses, as well as one uh, that went to a uh, relative of mine. So um, proof is in the pudding. I mean, I don't know what that means in the context of, of a mattress. But uh, the fact of the matter is uh, these are the most comfortable mattresses we have in our homes um Saul has one and I have one at the uh at the satellite apartment you know I was able to get that's I'm what it's called now that's what I call it the satellite. that's the one that's the one that yeah it's the satellite apartment <laughs> well, people who who have a similar uh situation as I do with uh separations understand I'm going about. to the satellite apartment god damn it <laughs> There's no context <laughs> in which I would say that. Look, get 50 bucks toward you said a that's select the end of the show yesterday. I did not say yes, that. Yes, you did. What? You said we said you have ring of fire. You said no. I'm going to the satellite. Department. I did not say that. <laughs> get fifty dollars toward select mattresses by visiting Casper.com/majority and using majority at checkout. Why would I even say that in that context? Why are you protesting so much? I don't know. It's a very strange thing. Uh, Casper.com/majority. Offer code MAJORITY. Going to the satellite apartment <laughs> for $50 off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions apply. All right.
this is um I don't the 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 race in Michigan is pretty tight too, isn't it? Um people for need to get out there and vote for Whitmer. That's another there crucial are, race right look, there. Look, there it's, you know, Georgia, Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, these are huge, huge governor races. Um that Democrats have a very good chance to pick up. These would all be pickups. And um, Minnesota seems pretty safe right now. These are hugely important. I, I mean, I just can't. I, I know everybody who listens to this program is going to vote. But um, make sure that you are aware of at least a half a dozen other people that you know are voting. I just came up with that metric. I don't know what that means, but it can't hurt. It's like pay it forward, but for voting. Exactly. Um, and uh, in this guy, in Michigan, um, Whitmore is a pretty good candidate. She's not, uh, she wasn't m my choice in the primary. I don't vote there, of course, but uh, she's a pretty good candidate. Um, and she's been endorsed by, um, I think, uh, Bernie came in and has also uh, was, has campaigned on her behalf, I think. Um, but she is running uh, in in Michigan against this guy, Bill Shute. I don't know what position he holds now, but um, the idea that a Republican could win the governorship in Michigan is just sort of disturbing based upon what we've seen of the Republican Party um, in, in, in the way that they have uh, treated uh, some of these cities, like uh, Flint and whatnot. But he's the attorney general. He's the attorney general. And... So shoot on duty is his uh, is his Twitter handle, which is just mm. uh, and apparently American Bridge, which is a uh, Democratic uh, supporting pack, got a hold of video from 1989. It is it's unclear where where the video is from, uh, but it was some documentary or inter industrial or we don't know. But he is being interviewed, and the woman behind the camera. Uh, ask him, could you move a little bit closer to the uh, what they call in the business the practical? That is a light that was on in, on camera, and so he shifts down and listen to how creepy this guy is. Um, not a flattering look for this guy, and I don't know. Well, let's make an assessment of it afterwards. Could you please move closer? To the I would be happy to move closer to the lamp. I will do anything you want. Some things I may not let you run the camera on. But I will certainly happily. It is no easy task. I admire your tenacity. Appreciate your spirit of Vincent van Gogh, Rembrandt, Toulouse Lautrec. Oh my God! That's that is creepy. Wow. Creepy. I can feel the douche chills going all down my spine right now. It is unbelievable. It almost, honestly, it honestly, like, I feel like you could just sew this right into a an episode of The Office, and it would totally fit in. Except Carell's was, character was slightly less like evil or something. Like there was yeah. something really. It wasn't like. The unintended grossness of a doofus. It I like how he tries like to really first... impress her with, uh, like, first off, she's saying, I just want to put you in a, you know, a, a, a good framing. And clearly the guy doesn't know any film references. <laughs> so, so he instead, uh, he instead throws out, like, uh, Art History 101. Van Gogh, Toulouse, Le Trek. Oh, move closer to the light. Secret uh -huh. message received. Yeah, message received. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They've been married for about 15 years now. Yeah. Who is that? Yeah. <laughs> I was you know going to say it was like a cross between uh, creepy like gonzo porn and Patrick Bateman. Like a gonzo porn starring Patrick Bateman. Wait, who's, who's Patrick Bateman? The guy from American Psycho. But oh, then again, okay. that guy was actually pretty smooth. Yeah, You have a great sense of mise-en-scene. Well, that would have been the <laughs> yeah, actual. <laughs> Shoot looked like he was drunk off of his own horniness. Yes, that. exactly. I can't believe how terrible. Can we right shoot now. this so I can this. go masturbate? No, the blood rushes away from your brain. <laughs> <laughs> they can't <laughs> talk. He was lightheaded because he was so hard. <laughs> I did. He did seem like he was like high on a Percocet or something. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, what I'm reminded of. I forgot about this until we played the clip. This guy 
uh, tried to position himself, though, against Schneider in terms of what happened in Flint. Of course. He gave, well, he gave some, like, press conferences when that first broke about people going to jail and stuff. And I remember we played it on the show, and we were like, is this guy really a Republican that he would come out swinging this hard on this? So he's definitely, I mean, this creepiness aside, and apparently I guess she's up nine points in a poll, but he's been ahead of the curve in trying to do, like, I'm not like all the other racist, right. criminal, austerity Republicans. I mean, as Attorney General, does he have any liability over what's been going on in that state? He doesn't. Have, well, he doesn't have liability. I mean, I think he's brought charges against some people with regards to Flint, but he did not take it to the top. He implied in that clip that he was going to take it at Schneider right. uh, back then. Right. Well, he does have a history of coming out hard, so there we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> God, I appreciate your sense of mise en scene. Yeah, yes, really tenacious. Van Gogh, so tenacious. Rembrandt, Ga- Van Gogh. <laughs> I think he. That must be like a signal that I think he uh, was Woody Allen fan. I somebody, like one, uh, one, I somebody, can't remember what movie it was. Somebody it, should ask him if he's boofed yet, because I think he probably was boofing right there. Oh gosh! <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Digby. Satellites. For a little while, I love to watch things on TV. Uh, Lou Reed, for uh, those who are listening on the podcast, Satellite of Love. Uh, well done, Matt. Folks, it's Casual Friday, and on some Casual Fridays, we actually get this casual that we play this song. Are you ready for some TV? go uh who who did that song uh, hot cologne hot cologne i don't know who that is but hot cologne doing the digby song uh heather a part in digby welcome uh, back to the program thanks for having me i'm so thrilled to have my own song yeah right that's a pretty good one and it's like uh yeah well you know i can't i'm trying to rem- like i can't quite place that song but i i i, I know uh, it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of squeeze it does, and I love Squeeze, one of my favorite bands of the 70s. So it's very cool. Wait, and, Squeeze uh, is 70s yeah, or I mean, 80s? Yeah, I, I love it. 80s. Squeeze is 80s. 
Yeah, they were around in the late 70s, too. All right. Well, I was I, there, I've Sam. Put, I know. I've, I've been put in my place. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, Heather. I'm embarrassed a, to admit. Yeah. A lot of insanity uh, this week. I mean, probably not that different from other weeks. But this, um, I, I want to talk about the, the, there is a report now that the Turks have told U.S. officials that they have audio and video recordings that prove that Jamal Khashoggi, this is a Washington Post columnist uh, who is a U.S. resident. He had traveled to uh, Turkey, was going to the uh, consulate in Istanbul to get paperwork uh, ostensibly for his marriage. Um, And he uh, went in, never came out. And apparently U.S. intelligence uh, services had word that um, uh, that uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman uh, had the uh, crown prince of of Saudi Arabia had basically personally ordered this guy to be killed. And now the Turkish government is saying that they have audio and video. Apparently they bug everywhere in Turkey. Um that proves that that you can hear the guy being beaten, the guy being uh, killed. And they have played this for or given it or made U.S. officials aware of this. I just want to remind people, we played this video yesterday, but I want to remind this uh, uh, people, uh, this is what Donald Trump's response was. I think it was his second response to uh, the Khashoggi uh, killing. Um, And this is what his response was in the White House. So what good does that do us? There are other things we can do. Well, do you think they should pay a price if it's it's out? Yeah, there'll there'll be something that has to take place. First, I want to find out what happened. And we're looking. Again, this took place in Turkey. And to the best of our knowledge, uh, Khashoggi is not a United States citizen. Is that right? Or is that right? He's a permanent resident. Okay. We don't like it, John. We don't like Pause it. Pause it for one second. I love how, uh, uh, Heather, that Trump says, to the best of our knowledge, uh, he's not, <laughs> what he's basically saying is like, I haven't quite read into this uh, yet. I just, uh, <laughs> and then someone says he was a resident. Okay, you, uh, right. Okay. Well, I guess our knowledge is a little more updated than I thought. Right. Get get Steve Ducey on the horn here. I need to find out if he was actually an American citizen or right. not. Right, Exactly. Like, would that make his killing less bad if he wasn't a citizen? No, if he was a to citizen. Trump. I mean, yeah. Well, to Trump, obviously, they, from their perspective, uh, that is part of their American first, uh, 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 you know, in that their obligations are less if he's just a resident. But uh, continue. And we don't like it even a little bit. But as to whether or not we should stop $110 billion from being spent in this country, knowing they have four or five alternatives, two very good alternatives, that would not be acceptable to me. Okay, but we're looking for the answer, and I think probably you'll have an answer sooner than people think. Thank you. Yeah, right. Okay, so... Um- <laughs> I mean, first off, it's not $110 billion. I think the deal is for something closer to like $30 billion, but that's irrelevant, right? Um, the, this calculation, and it may be the case that uh, the Saudis can go to China or to Russia to buy the military equipment they want. I, 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 I don't know that it would be that easy for them to do that, but I suppose they could. Um, but that calculation of... Our American foreign policy. I mean, here's the thing. Trump puts it in rather stark terms, but that calculation of American foreign policy seems to me to have dictated the relationship we've had with Saudi Arabia for decades. Well, true. And plus the oil. You know, right. let's not forget that. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, remember, and it's funny to keep keep in mind as we look at this story, I think, is, you know, remember, you know, Bandar Bush, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the envoy from Saudi Arabia that was great friends, so close with the Bush family that he was called a member of the Bush family. Yep. Pictures of Bush going all the way, but Obama, Clinton, you know, going all the way back, holding hands with, uh, literally holding hands with, with you know, members of the, the Saudi royal family. Nothing new about that. And it's always been concerning, particularly now that we've decided to really arm up the Saudi Arabian military so that they can fight our proxy wars over there, which is even more repulsive than it has been in the past. 
Um, nonetheless, let's not, you know, try and pretend that this is business as usual because it really isn't. Uh, they, it has this has escalated under Trump uh, on in a new direction that I don't think we've ever quite seen before, and it has to do with two things. Number one, the president being the personal arms dealer of the world, you know, this is what he, he considers himself to be. That's a little unusual, putting it right out there in the front going, hey, man, you know, we got money involved here, dudes, we got to do it. To say this up front, no, no regard for human rights at all, is a change. I mean, there's always been, you know, tension is probably not the right word to use, it, there's always been tremendous hypocrisy there, but there was at least some, you know, sense that the United States was going to at least rhetorically stand up for human rights. The second thing, of course, is the fact that Trump himself apparently has a lot of financial dealings with Saudi, personal financial dealings with Saudi Arabia. He's on record saying that he gets forty, fifty million dollars a year from Saudi. We know that Jared Kushner, who's great friends with the new. Um, you know, a uh, more autocratic young uh, prince who's taken over the, the country, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS they call him. And he and Jared are big buds, and they, you know, have all-nighters together and do a lot of back-channel uh, discussion, evidently. That's something that's a little bit different. And Jared Kushner and his family have tremendous financial exposure. Apparently they've been begging for money throughout that area for a long time. And then finally, you have the fact that Trump has is also on record and has been since the time he started campaigning at saying that he doesn't care if foreign uh, leaders kill journalists. I mean, they asked him about Vladimir Putin. He went, hey, you know, there's a lot of killing going on right. in this world. Like, we've killed people, too, so let's not get too, you know, fine and fancy here. That That's just the way, and he said, that's just the way it is. You can't blame anybody, really for looking at the comments that President Trump makes about the press over and over and over again, and authoritarians all over the world are mimicking him now, and th believing that he's not going to really go to the mat if they decide to take out a journalist who is critical of their regime. So, you know, we do have some new elements to this Saudi-U.S. relationship that uh, have taken this to an even more, um, you know, <laughs> corrupt level than it's ever been before. How messed up is it that the enabling of a civil war that's killing hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, civilians, right? Um, you know, the the most recent high profile was uh, killing 40 school children on a bus. I mean— you know, like I understand why the why the press gets agitated, and and I think like anything that in any way um, in inhibits the relationship that we have with Saudi Arabia, I think is a positive thing. Uh, but it's we live in a weird. I mean, it's it's just sad to me that. Uh, the Khashoggi killing, and I understand why, right? It's a lot more intriguing uh, than just sort of the same old, same old, oh, we're supporting a uh, the, the killing of, of people in Yemen. I mean, who, you know, uh, that's, that's old hat. But it, it, it is sort of stunning that we can't get as exercised about that as a society as we can about uh, one colonist. Well, particularly, and let's, you know, I mean, I do think that the concerns about, you know, the safety of journalists worldwide, particularly considering that there seems to be an escalation of, I mean, it's the, I think it was just, was it Bulgaria? Right. Uh, just this past week had another horrific, you know, rape and killing of a, of a journalist there who had been uh, in doing some kind of investigative work on anti corruption, right. anti-corruption. I mean, this stuff is happening a lot. Let's just put it that way. In these sort of authoritarian regimes, it's very disturbing. And of course, you know, you hear the echoes of it here and places like Brazil and and other places where you feel this kind of authoritarian stuff rising. Now, th but what you say, of course, is true. And this this. The war in Yemen, I mean, this has been sort of in the background here for years. Uh, this is not something that is uh, unique to, to the Trump administration, although from everything I've been reading recently, they have escalated it 
or at least sort of enabled it in a in a much more um, you know obvious way than they had than the Obama administration, which had evidently been trying to ratchet it back in some respects. But it doesn't matter because nonetheless, the fact is is that we've been um, supplying money and arms to other countries to fight this war that nobody really understands. It's another one of those, right? I mean, right. how many do we have to have? Um, and you'd think, you know, I, I think that what happens is is that people sort of get the idea that these proxy wars that happen all over the world, that somehow or another, I don't know, is there some theory that maybe they're letting off steam in small places so that a big ex- bigger explosion doesn't happen? I mean, I don't even know. But it seems like I've been uh, reading about this my whole life, and I'm old. So, you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, maybe one of the, um, you know, things about Trump, which is really kind of perverse, is that his America First uh, – his America First philosophy, to the extent that it's a philosophy, it really isn't. It's a slogan. But somehow or another, it's mixing all that up, right? I mean, it's at least kind of stirring it up in a way that people who don't normally take a position on those sorts of things are looking at it in a different way because coming from Trump, it means something different than it has in the past. So maybe that will be a salutary effect of this train wreck of an administration. I don't know. Well, I mean, talking about that and just uh, pivoting from that, because, you know, the the Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh confirmation and, you know, we it was the 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 short circuiting of the investigation, the the withholding of documents, juxtaposing this to uh, the Republicans not giving Merrick Garland a hearing, the implications of Kavanaugh on the on the court. I mean, you know, where Neil Gorsuch apparently was was like, I don't know about this permanent detention thing for immigrants <laughs> uh, years after they've been, you know, gotten some type of, um, you know, parking ticket or something. You know, when Neil Gorsuch is the voice of reason now on the court. <laughs> I mean, the the this whole Kavanaugh thing seems to me. And, and and people are writing about it like to the extent that and you wrote a piece that the that there's no there's no daylight between Trump and the Republicans anymore. I I like just the idea that that has to be written like that. It isn't uh, that your editor wouldn't say, like, come on, uh, Heather, everybody knows that. Right. Like there still is this sort of quality. There was nothing about the Kavanaugh hearing. Maybe a little bit, but but just more almost like literary, right? If I was drawing like, you know, some type of like uh, it, it was a literary device. Oh, I know the thing that can hold this guy up. It can be that he has these uh, accusations of sexual assault, which would be a good tie in and like a nice reflection of the president who nominated him. But that's just a literary <laughs> device. But but I mean, putting that aside, every other dynamic about it was purely Republican. And somehow we still have the situation where like the Republicans are not, are, you know, like the idea that Jeff Flake can get up there and say, like, we should have someone challenge the president because what's going on here is not about the Republican Party. And, you know, and and and, 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 and but but it is. But it, it, it totally is. Donald Trump is not the cause of the Republican Party. Donald Trump is just simply an outward manifestation. He's just a, you know, like a um, a lesion that is coming from a, a you know, a, a, a bigger disease. And the lesion hurts and it's disgusting uh, and it's problematic, but that's not the root of the problem. I mean, we saw it. Kavanaugh, it, the, the whole Kavanaugh fiasco it seems to me to exemplify this. And, and my sense is like there isn't there hasn't been this. Our society has not absorbed that. Well, there's obviously a deep, deep yearning for this not to be true, right? I mean, and here's a perfect way of sort of, you know, bookending it. The the John McCain funeral in which everybody went, oh, you know, look, it's the establishment and they care and, you know, this is what it used to be like and, oh, look, George Bush, he handed Michelle Obama a cough drop and, and they're just, you know, they're, look, how, look how they get along, it's a beautiful thing and this is, this is the way it used to be. Fast forward, you know, what, two, three weeks, whatever it was, and you've got the Kavanaugh hearing. 
and all hell breaks loose. We've got, you know, protesters in the hallways, and everybody's all upset. And, you know, what we find out is that Brett Kavanaugh, who is, by the way, I mean, he's going to make, we're, we're going to be yearning for Antonin Scalia, because Scalia, at least, was not a pure, unadulterated political operative sitting on the Supreme Court. He had, he was a right winger. He was, you know, he was a slightly weird, adulterated operative, a slightly but, adulterated operative. But no, but he didn't come up. That, that wasn't way. his pedigree. That's, developed, right. That's right. That wasn't right. his pedigree. Right. And he had developed a, a philosophy, which, you know, you and I obviously find odious and somewhat stupid, but it was just originalism. You know, we got to get do a mind meld with, you know, Thomas Jefferson in order to understand what the law should be today. All of that. But it did exist on a certain kind of intellectual plane, and Kavanaugh does not come from that, he, and in fact he isn't that. He's just solely on that court to advance right-wing, uh, the right-wing agenda in whatever way it's necessary to do it. I don't think you're going to find intellectual consistency in any way from this guy. Now, that man was basically put on the court not just by Donald Trump, who knows nothing about you know, Supreme Court justices or conservative jurisprudence, nothing. He put, if, he, if there was a reason that he put him on there, it was probably because he figured he got a good loyal vote for him that he can pardon himself, right? That's about the extent of his reasoning behind it, and that he could score a big win. The person who put him on that court was George W. Bush, and right. the way he did it was by lobbying <laughs> Susan Collins over and over again. She's a big friend of the family, and they love Brett, and he's a good guy, and he's one of them. So, you know, that's where that came from. That 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 merging, you could see it right there in that particular um you know, it, it, event, and it was a huge political event, you know, all the Sturm und Drang and, and emotion that went into that. Um, but essentially, that was the Republican establishment putting a, po- a, a right-wing political operative hitman on the court. And that has nothing to, that's not Trump. That's them. And they pulled out all the stops to get that done. And at the end of the day, when Susan Collins gave her speech, in which she gaslighted the whole country and was willing to stand up in front of everybody and make this big, big, you know, sort of grand statement telling us that Brett Kavanaugh is not the man we saw with our own eyes just days before, uh, acting like a, you know, a petulant uh, schoolyard bully in front of the, the U.S. Senate. No, that never happened. He's really a wonderful person. He's a great guy, and he's going to be fine. And, you know, all you people, you, the, the, the protesters and the special interests and all this, she said she could have easily been Donald Trump. I mean, it's her own particular spin on it. But everything she said in that speech was Trumpian. Uh, and so, you know, we see the full absorption of whatever was tattered remains there were of the Republican establishment came together, and there they are. And I don't see anybody. I don't see it going back in any way. Do you? No. I mean, when when are these? But what? How are these people gonna gonna retract any of this stuff? I mean, this is them. This is who they are. Well, I, I think they're going to be able to retract it if there uh, if there's no. I mean, if there's not a broader understanding of that's what happened. I mean, all right, so point in case, or case in point, I should say, um, Chuck Schumer, once again, just yesterday, basically crafts a deal. I'm hesitant to say deal because usually there's like a, there's two aspects of a deal, right? The give and the get. Um, Chuck Schumer crafts a deal yesterday to essentially fast track 15 Trump judges, three on three or four on the Court of Appeals, I think it was. These are all lifetime positions on federal uh, uh, on the federal judiciary. Ostensibly, it was so that Democratic uh, senators going uh, can go home and and campaign and protect themselves. Um, it is the case, my understanding, that it would have taken 30 senators to essentially slow down this process dramatically. And that would have meant keeping every Republican center, senator in Washington, right? Like each senator could have been responsible for talking for an hour, which would have uh, like uh, created uh, or would have, uh, you know, uh, created, uh, allowed for 30 hours of debate on each um, uh, of, of the 
the confirmees or the nominees, and all the Republicans would have to be there to vote. And that's if Chuck Schumer's not willing to do this or can't convince his caucus to do this, why should anyone else take the judiciary seriously? Like 30 judges with lifetime appointments have been brought to the Supreme to, to the federal courts within the last 60 days. And Heidi Heitkamp, and, and, and this is also a problem with the media too. I mean, even the left wing media, Heidi Heitkamp, could very well lose her race in North Dakota now because of a ruling by the Eighth Circuit Court on on uh, on a, a voter ID case. Right. It went up to the Supreme Court four four. It bounces back down. And it's the ruling of this uh, of this Eighth Circuit Court that's going to hold. There are 11 justices on there. Ten of them are appointed by Republican presidents, including three by Trump. There's one justice who was appointed by Obama. That justice was the one who dissented in the two to one decision that is basically going to disenfranchise thousands of Native Americans because they have a P.O. box on their I.D. instead of uh, a street address. There's a there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect. There's a reason why you can't get the people on the left to care about the judges because Chuck Schumer, like there's never going to be a mass protest against Chuck Schumer to not, uh, you know, usher in 15, 30 judges at the wave of a hand. But that it has to come from the leadership. I mean, this is just seems well, to be just shocking. Yeah, and I mean, look, there were mass protests just a week ago of people in the Capitol building, you know, protesting Kavanaugh, you know, right. vociferously against Kavanaugh. Right. And that should have shown that, you know, look, you've got you've these, you know, you've got a base that's got your back here, Democrats. They're here. They're 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 trying to to reinforce what the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee were attempting to do. You know, which was at least put up a fight, at least show that there was, you know, that they were they were working it to the to the extent possible. I don't understand this. I I think I, I suspect that what's happened is that Mitch McConnell and Trump too, uh, all of them have decided. You know, they they they've launched this you know mob mentality thing. You know, right where it's the angry mob based upon a bunch of rape survivors survivors coming and giving testimony in the hallways in in uh, the Senate two weeks ago, which apparently was just really frightening to all these Republican senators. They were just terrified by that angry mob of women, rape survivors. Um, and, you know, that this is the new thing. They say, oh, look, they're, they're out of control. They're getting violent. They're doing this, you know, and a tremendous case of projection, you know, the pot calling the kettle black. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think it has to do with they're not trying to fool their own people into being afraid, right? I think that is a mistake, um, an interpretation of what this is about. What this is about is trying to Hector, Chuck Schumer, and the rest of the Democratic leadership into doing things like what they just did in the hopes that what they will do is suppress their own base. They're trying to get the Democrats to uh, behave in craven fashion <laughs> and, and get scared so that they can somehow or another disappoint the base of the Democratic Party and maybe you know re let the air out of some of this enthusiasm. I don't think it will work. I think that enthusiasm has a life of its own, and it's not based on anything Chuck Schumer does. But that's my theory about what they're trying to do, because I don't think there are no right-wingers at Trump rallies who are actually afraid of the left's angry mob, right? That just goes against that dissonant on how they think of the left snowflakes who, you know, are too sensitive to, to breathe. So that's not really what they're doing. They're trying to get Schumer to do things like this. And by the way, that stuff really works with the Democratic leadership is, you know, saying, oh, you better not get out of hand, boys. You know, you're going to ruin everything for yourself. And they kind of go, oh, OK, you know, don't make trouble. They, they, I, I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the uh, I, I think there is I mean, if you remember the, in the run up to um, the the vote for Kavanaugh, the, the the whole thing looked like this is really bad for Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it turns out that, no, actually, the polling that came in afterwards shows that hey, it's not bad for Democrats. Um, you know, like there there was when we get between, you know, uh, September 1st and really October uh, 1st, 
what happens is all of those undecided, all the people who have not been paying attention, they basically come home. And so, you know, those people who are naturally going to be uh, Republican voters, they come home and shore up maybe some places. That's like, you know, I think what happened with Ted Cruz, you know, Texas mm-hmm. is a Republican state. Uh, you know, Beto looked uh, really good and we got uh, all excited about him. He still, you know, has a chance, but uh, because we don't know who's really going to turn up. But those Republicans are in a very red state and Texas is still a red state. Um, and they're going to come back out for the Republican. And I think on some level, like, I don't understand how the Democrats don't have this level of savvy. And people can say, well, it's not a question of savvy. You know, they really want these people on the circuit court. I, I, I that to me just seems far fetched. I don't think yeah, that there's I don't think I don't I agree with you. I don't think that's true. I mean, it's very easy to to develop that level of cynicism. And I'm sure it's true for some people, right? Somebody struck a deal somewhere or right. somehow their, you know, corporate interests that you know will supersede whatever. But this is an existential threat <laughs> to Democrats. The, the this court packing that is going on during the Trump administration. It really is. I mean, the, you know, these, this is a court, a Supreme Court that had already overturned the Voting Rights Act. And the the case that you just mentioned, let's face it, if that had been uh, gone to the full court with Kavanaugh on it, the same thing would have happened, right? right? I mean, it's not like he's going to suddenly stra- have, a, have a, you know, a surge of conscience and say, oh, I can't really, I don't want to disenfranchise a bunch of Native Americans. I mean, we know where he's going. So, uh, you know, this... The, the situation with voting and immigration in this country across the board on a federal level, which, of course, both of those things end up being voting, in, in, you know, in the end always ends up being a federal issue and immigration is a federal issue. Um, this is an existential threat to the Democratic Party. There's a reason why they want all these people on the court, and that's because they want Democrat, you know, this 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 ongoing sort of uh, degradation of democracy that we're seeing with with few uh, minority rule being the rule more often. People, you know, we've had two presidential elections in the last 16 years that were decided in the electoral college instead of the popular vote. That only happened once before in our history back in the 1800s. So. You know, this, this is becoming the new normal that this mind, they are, you know, I hate to use a Trumpian word, but they're rigging the system. And the fact that Democrats are not, you know, going, going to the mat on that particular issue is an act of political suicide. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that just does not make sense to me. I mean, this is one of those things where, and it's one of the reasons why I thought the Kavanaugh fight was, you know, I'm going, okay, you know, at least start putting the pressure on going the other direction here, you've got to stop. And all the suddenly people are talking about, you know, adding seats to the court and doing various other things. They have to. This isn't a matter of just, well, you know, we don't want to be <laughs> we don't want to push too hard here or that would be uncivil or whatever. I mean they have to do it. Otherwise they, look at what they're doing. I mean it's happening before our eyes. And they are basically setting up a system that will allow them to uh, seize federal power, and in many cases in the states as well, um, with, the, with minority rule for as far as the eye can see, based upon these rulings that are that are making it possible for a minority Republican Party to nonetheless win elections. I mean, that's you know, this is something out of some banana republic. You know, this is this is something that that uh, is happening, and the Democrats seem to be sort of blinking and going, "Gee, what do we do?" And uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I, 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 I never thought. I mean, I was not as um, skeptical as Harry Re- of Harry Reid. I think as some, but I never thought that I would uh, be have this much of a sense of longing for a guy like Harry Reid. Frankly, I mean, I think Chuck Schumer has made some major, major missteps. I mean, this is one of them. I think also, you know, we, I think we've talked about this in the past uh, a couple of years ago with the that going into December and that deal he made where he thought he was going to get DACA. Uh, oh. And, um, and I, 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 you know, it's funny because I think it was uh, Weigel. I can't remember, but we had a conversation. Um, I'm pretty sure it was on this show with a reporter who said, you know, by and large, the, um, the S- senatorial caucus is happy with Schumer. And, um, that to me is disturbing too. 
I mean, I, you know, like I, I don't, I don't know how easy it is to get rid of a, um, uh, a, a Senate leader, but, um, but gosh, uh, he just doesn't seem to quite get it. Well, think about this too. I mean, Harry Reid, for all of his faults, and he had plenty. I mean, you know, I don't worship the guy, but he came from a state where he had to actually fight for every election too. You right. know, I mean, it's a, Nevada is a is a. Uh, you know, it's a swing state at best, often a red state, and he had to fight for every election, and yet he had this, you know, sort of pugilistic style about him. And you've got Schumer there. He's from New York, for crying out loud. I mean, he is the you know, he's not, he's not going to lose his seat, right? I mean, he's as safe as, as he can be. I think that maybe in Schumer's case, this may be the one situation, you know, you and I were just saying, well, you know, it isn't really that they're, you know, thoroughly corrupt. It's that you know, they're just kind of dumb. In Schumer's case, you know, he really has some allegiance to certain uh, industries, Wall Street in particular, that another uh, Democrat would not have. Right. Would I mean, this is a very, you know, symbiotic relationship between the senator, this particular senator from New York, and the, you know, big financial industry concerns. I, I, I mean, and I think that's something Democrats should think about when they're when they're dealing with their leadership. You know, it's nice to have them in a safe state, safe, you know, district or state. I agree with that. That gives them a lot more leeway. But it, it not if it doesn't give the state, them leeway, right? right? I mean, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I agree totally. Um, well, hopefully, um, uh, we'll start to see some. I, I don't know where how that happens. I mean, I don't know how uh, you know how that happens. But um, uh, Chuck Schumer is increasingly uh, problematic, and I think it's. Does important. anybody know how he? Because uh, I had always thought, and this is a uh, this is a question I really should should do some research on. I thought that Dick Durbin was the guy who was next in line to be after Reed, right? I mean, he had always sort of been a second in command, and maybe he doesn't have, I don't know, some kind of leadership quality, but I had always thought he was the guy. He's, he's more, more, you know, traditionally liberal than Schumer is. Yep. And somehow or another, Schumer, Schumer got, got the job, and I've always wondered what the dynamic was there. I, I don't really know. And then he talked about Patty Murray, too, who's also, you know, a powerful person in leadership. I don't really know exactly why Schumer ended up in that in that spot. It wasn't a given for years and years, right? Uh, he was not sort of this, you know, the the heir apparent. Um, so I, it's 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 an interesting question. I, I'm sure there's an answer to it. I just don't happen to know it. Uh, I, nor do I. But um, it's a shame it went that way. And I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll see an opportunity uh, soon. Heather. As always, a real pleasure. Thanks so much for your time this week. Thanks for having me, Sam. Have a good weekend, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. All right, folks. We're going to take a uh, quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Matthew Film Guy, uh, ostensibly here to give us a um, film suggestion. But you never know with Matthew Film Guy what you're going to get, right? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know which depressing Swedish film you're going to get. There you go. <laughs> we'll be right back after this.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Friday in almost everywhere that you're listening, although I guess conceivably if you are listening in Australia, uh, it is Saturday. But nevertheless, when it is Friday here in the eastern part of the United States or Saturday in Australia, uh, what we do is we uh, occasionally have a guest on who will give us a film recommendation for the upcoming weekend. And uh, this week, that guy is the guy depicted in this song. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew, film guy, Matthew, film guy. Great what, song. What, um, what do you have for us, Matthew, that could possibly be any more um, uh, unbelievable than what we saw yesterday with uh, Kanye in the White House? Um, is there anything, I mean, does fiction, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, Matthew. How are you? How's that? I'm great, Sam. How are you? I'm just uh, sitting here in my epistemological bubble watching depressing Swedish films. <laughs> there you go. Uh, anyone in particular, or just uh, do you just have like a montage, uh, like a clip reel of depressing Swedish films? It's just constant Swedish films, only Swedish. Actually, have I ever recommended a Swedish film to you people? I, I don't, don't think, think so. so. I think I you have. I'd be very surprised. Uh, so that is a slanderous. I think uh, you know, like, you know, it's it's about like, it, it's a family racist to film guys. It's a family that has multiple uh, lines of incest, but really it's about <laughs> late stage capitalism, but also incest in a way that you might find unsettling because we don't, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's my impression did, of a film guy. Michael, did I tell you what this week's film is already? Jeez. <laughs> It's incest, but it's really, aren't yeah. we all committing incest yeah. in a certain way, if you think about it, the way we relate to our planet's finite resources. Anyway, it <laughs> also reminds me of Castavetti's sap. Yeah. yeah, take note, everybody. If you're going to mock me, that is the way to do it. There you go. Uh, now, uh, Matthew, but before we get to any more mocking for the time being. Yeah. And uh, Why not? What's that? Yeah, why not? Go ahead. What, um... What is what is what's new with you? What are you doing these days? Uh, any new interesting projects? Did you work on this uh, um, uh, Ted Alexandro? Uh, uh, what do you, is a concert movie? Yeah, his hour special that finally came out. Everybody can go to atcspecials.com. He put it out through the artist-owned comedians collective uh, company called All Things Comedy. You know, they're sort of like do you remember United Artists. What they were for Hollywood. Yeah. This is what this is what they uh, sort of started. Comedian run, artist owned, and uh, so his new special, Senior Class of Earth, is out. People have heard me talk about it, but really, you know, you you should talk to Ted your, yourself directly and have him tell you how great it is. Because all I can tell you is that I had a great time working on it. Mary and I produced it and directed it, and I edited it. It's really I'm very proud of it. It's it's funny and it's political, but it's also just. Uh, you know, a little bit of uh, lightheartedness about the shitstorm that is our current lives. Uh, we should uh, have Ted on. We should have Ted on. We'll, we'll see if we can uh, yeah. we'll put that into the uh, to the, uh, the 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 machine that we have here and see if we can. Well, that's very kind of you, Sam. I think that's a great idea. But wait, tell me a little bit more about this collective, or maybe I should wait and ask him about it. Uh, it's you know, it's I don't I don't know that much about it. I know that Bill Burr and Al Madrigal started it, and they basically are kind of a. You know, they, they this is Ted's is actually their first special. So their first uh, they started out doing albums and a lot of podcasts. They have a big variety of uh, comedian podcasts, which is uh, a thing. Oh, right. And well, uh, case, this is their first foray. I don't want to promote any competitors. So uh, that's right. Forget that. 
Um, no, that sounds interesting to me. I did not. I was not aware of it. I was not aware of that uh, that collective. I like. I like. Yeah. I like to hear stuff like that. I think that's good. Yeah, me too. Me too. Even if you're not a huge fan of all the comedians involved, I think the premise is a great one. Ooh, and uh, that's, it's uh, supporting. That's a little red flaggy. <laughs> well, look, they they run the gamut. You know, uh, Bill Burr and uh, Al Madrigal are two high quality comedians. Uh, but there's some lesser known names that uh, necessarily aren't my cup of tea. But uh, they definitely showed their uh, bona fides in terms of thing. where they know they know talent when they see it by buying Ted Special and producing it and putting it out themselves. So everyone go to atcspecials.com and check it out right after you check out my eBay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, Matthew, so what else have you been doing? How long ago did you uh, edit and uh, and produce and direct that thing? There's no need to mention that. But um, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a process getting it to the right audience. So uh, we shot it last year, and we've been All working right. on it ever since. All right. I'm just curious and, what the uh, turnaround time for your yeah, other projects is. So I've just is. been watching Swedish movies the whole time since then. So I, I'm just curious as to what your, your turnaround time for your other projects are. I'm it's an incestual relationship between a brother and a <laughs> sister. But actually, it turns out to be a father and a daughter, which is sort of the twist. <laughs> but really, it's an indictment of... <laughs> Patriarchy and the I've, sense I've run that out we of feel father daughter incest capitalism films, but I'm going to find more comfortable in our own skin. But should we? Um, it's about five hours long. Everybody should check that. Out. Are you uh, are you teaching uh, at uh, your learning annex uh, thing too? Yes, that we're gearing up for the new fall um, section. I wouldn't call it a semester, but yeah, we're gearing up for that. I've just been programming that. I've got a lot of good stuff lined up for that. Um, films of deep soul searing truth to spring on unsuspecting senior citizens of the Jewish persuasion. Yes. Um, now, have you ever thought about like that. branching out to like um, senior citizens of like non-Jewish senior citizens or just, you're just going to. What about just Polish gonna... or Chinese? Fair. Fair. All right. Fair enough. Uh, there you have it. Um, but no, uh, you know, I, actually, I just got back from a, a short vacation, the first one I was able to take in a long time, down to my mother's in Boca, and um, uh, I was able to actually catch up on a lot of, you know, as a film guy, you amass a large list of films that you're supposed to be seeing at all times, and I actually was recently able to get through a, a, a sizable chunk of some of those. Uh, it's funny that you, you know, um, uh, John Benjamin, in his uh, book, um uh, failure is an option, which incidentally was huh. just yeah. coincidentally the name of a script I had written for AMC uh, about five years ago. Just total coincidence. John had absolutely yeah, must be. Must total be so coincidence. coincidence. But uh, John retold the story. Um, I was in that book. I, I finally listened to that book of his. And uh, yeah. I, I was uh, uh, part of like half of those stories. And uh, not, right, not, I, I learned. That's not, amazing. Not credit. Are you allowed to say which ones? Not. I don't care. I don't. What is he okay. going to do? Sue me about my own stories? Um, <laughs> yes, I guess not. But, you know, I was in it too, but I'm not necessarily proud of my contribution. That's right. He doesn't. He didn't mention you, did he? Uh, no, and he didn't name, mention right. you either. Well, he did mention me, but not in the context of uh, of of uh, the the other stories, like the story about the uh, script where we got right. commissioned to write a script about right. a community like the one you went to in Boca. Yes. And uh, we went down there. We had an entree into the community from his uh, brother-in-law's dad. And we ended up and the brother, we ended up paying the brother-in-law's dad to write the script for us. It was a right. That is, I think, a, a genius old, level Andy Kaufman style idea. 75 year old, uh, Jewish man from a uh, from a, a retirement community who will love lots of Viagra jokes, lots of fart jokes. Yes, he wrote the uh, script, and we handed it in to uh, Conan O'Brien's company. And the uh, the note session was pretty funny when they were they, uh, <laughs> when they were were basically saying like oh, we feel like you guys are like maybe trying a little too hard to be funny in this one. We're like, what do you mean? And, <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, I love that story. We, that was one of the highlights so of John Benjamin's book. It was so book. obnoxious. I highly recommend it. Audio book. We actually paid like a, like a significant portion of our fee. And uh, then when we told them that we did it, and John and I were just laughing. We thought it was so funny. And they were just like, 
why, why did you do that? Because it's we, funny. We don't. Where, no one has a sense of humor around here? We don't get it. We hired you to write a script, and you thought it would be funny to give us someone else's script that was bad? Yes. I actually, I'm, I'm actually genuinely, like, I get them. Oh, no, being, I, I get, I get, I get them. No, I'm saying it. even from them, I get them being pissed, but I genuinely don't understand how nobody, how they, like, that is objectively funny. I think it probably added to our cachet in some fashion, like, uh, but. These guys are thinking outside of all the boxes. Oh, yes, totally. Like, uh, the, what, they're in a completely, whose box is this? Uh, but They're so far outside the box, they're in a different box. Yeah, it was a totally different box. I mean, we and when we found him, he was uh, directing, like, I can't remember what it was. It was some, you know. It was like, like community theater or something. It was, it was like Jewish theory. interpretations of community theater exactly. projects. Exactly. It would have been like, um, you know, the Schmada man instead of the music man or something. Some right, we, weird right. stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but, Matthew, let's. Uh, My let's, Fair Yenta. Yeah, exactly. Let, let's leave that di diversion. Are you working on any interesting proje uh, projects that we might be interested in? No? No. Okay. I actually have a couple projects that are brewing, but I can't really talk about them right now. Uh, you know, as I'm, I'm always working on my uh, home movie film, and I actually, while I was in Boca, wound up running into four more reels of untransferred Super 8 film how that my father took as hours, part of his massive surveillance project. How many hours of footage are you combing through to make a, uh, what? how long of a movie? Because this is something I, you have yeah, been doing for... I, I've been working on this for at least... 15 plus years because I every time I get off of another project I put a little time into it I got news for uh, you buddy massive. I got news for you you were working yeah. on this pretty sure when we met which would have been uh, yeah. in 2001 alright so now almost 20 years sure right. that sounds right I've been spending money on transferring it little by little but um, you know I, I always felt like I wasn't mature enough to make it at the beginning you know I didn't want it to be some sort of like I would agree with you that. know there's a genre of documentaries of like this is how my parents fucked me up like I, I didn't necessarily want to make another entry in that genre uh, I wanted something a little more broad or at least a little more nuanced um, but I don't know maybe I'm coming back to that theme as time goes on but oh, but well, anyway I how found, did I your found parents, two more how did your parents what's that? how did your parents I mean just to give, give me the uh, the elevator pitch on uh, how your parents uh, screwed you up and how it's going to be reflected in this in this documentary. Uh, let's see, elevator pitch, elevator pitch. Uh, a, com a combination of uh, benign neglect and over controlling. Okay, and that I mean, it sounds to me that you maybe should, the he a healthy dose right of narcissism. In the middle. I'm not should sure. Be... This is you know, this is it's developing. A lot of therapy going into the making of this movie. I see. So this is really this is a big budget film in a way. <laughs> yes, it is. The biggest, the biggest, the cast of thousands of neuroses. And so uh, what's new on the uh, eBay front? Anything new on that front? I mean, what do you... You know, people can go check it out. Go to my Twitter at Langdon Boom, and you can see that I have some stuff listed. Uh, you know, I'm getting rid of some stuff. I've lost a lot of weight in the past six months, so I'm kind of like moving through some fat clothes. Nice. Is that right? What have you been like doing? Matthew, film guy. How have you been doing that? Literally just diet. You know, I got, I got like a scary cholesterol level in January, and the doctor's like, you've got to come in right, right away and like massively change your diet. So I went on like a really serious, just low fat, low cholesterol, low animal product diet and wound up losing a lot of weight. Like literally no exercise even added or changed. I'm sure. Uh, but I'm I do sure. have a fitness tracker. I'm so anyway, so there's some clothes going coffee. out. What, so huh? wait, so so give me a sense. Like, what is that diet? I'm I'm curious what that looks like. A low uh, animal protein. You know, I ate, I ate like I ate like uh, no dairy. I I had like uh, you know steamed uh, chicken and tofu for dinner like half the nights of the week. Uh, you know, from the Chinese place. Uh, just anything grilled at home with like a teaspoon of olive oil. It was like super serious. I, I've I've since let up on that since my cholesterol got back under control, but. Uh, you know, it, it was it was massive. And so, it was a massive how much weight did you lose? We're only in October. You ten months. How many? How much weight? Well, I had already by, by my second um, blood test, which was in July, I had already lost like twenty five pounds, and I think wow. I've lost another like ten since then. You know, so according it, to Jordan Peterson, you could have lost more weight <laughs> if you'd had an all steak diet. 
Yes, I know it's not healthy. I know it's not a healthy amount, but I, I lost 35 pounds in eight months. It's just, you call it diet or whatever, but uh, if you treat it to New York strip steaks and you... It was like 57 pounds in six months. You'll lose months. Uh, 57 yeah, pounds. Yeah, he, 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 he lapped me. He lapped me for sure. So yeah. go on By Jordan Peterson's diet steak? if you really By want to be massive. And also your psoriasis was... and your snoring and all that. Uh, actually, I do think my snoring was relieved by lo- weight loss. But, oh, yeah, you know, definitely. That's... That, will def- that will definitely do it. But wait a second. He lost sixty pounds by eating only steak. Well, he first he ate oh, only he first says. he ate only meat and greens, but in the last six meat months he's greens. done with the greens and he only eats meat now. Oh, so that's the Atkins diet. It's not even Atkins because Atkins the it's like paleo. Atkins Atkins. It's not even paleo. I don't paleo, think paleo. You can no. eat no, vegetables. No, those those especially paleo they actually encourage you. To no eat vegetables. paleo. Paleo does uh, Atkins no. Not I can no vegetables, but not literally just meat. I don't think there's any diet where you literally. They would tell you that you could no also co- eat dairy. Yeah, he wouldn't. No dairy, no eggs. He's just just meat, meat no, and no meat. No eggs. Extra raw, no, please. please. Extra raw, please. And so, all sorts of psychic ailments I've had have gone away too. You know what? That. Ex- but stop using. Uh, stop using utensils. I'll, I'll tell you just eat with my fists uh, and my teeth. Man, I, <laughs> it's gonna be an epidemic. I did of the scurvy. Atkins diet. I did the Atkins, you did the Atkins diet, diet in like 1998 or something. Wow. You know, and when it was cool. When it when was, it was cool, very cool. When it first came what out. What did you eat? Uh, but I ate eggs and like sausage and cheese and I want just eggs all and fat and protein. Did lots you lose of weight? lots of chicken wings, Sam. If I recall, and I think I saw you eat a you lot lost of chicken weight, wings. Right? How'd you feel? Oh, yeah. uh, I felt like I was on steroids. Yes. <laughs> you mean your your nuts shrank? What happened? I got I got. Very aggressive, very aggro. Very aggro. <laughs> Felt like I was like a, like I had a tremendous amount of energy. My heart rate went up probably like by fifteen to twenty percent. Like, Sounds healthy. Just like I could just feel my heart. Like at any given time, I could feel my heart pumping. I'm just like this is amazing. Awesome. I can't believe I'm. I'm, I'm you know. Why are we not all on the Atkins diet? At that you time, you were high yeah. on factory Sounds farm good. animal fear. And, yes. and I'll tell you something: you, <laughs> I, so you become yes. an evangel, uh, you become evangelical about it. Like I'm just right. going around. I remember like saying, like, I don't know why you're not on this diet, man. I mean, this I've never felt so great in my life. And it's, Eat this raw meat. I mean, Eat this meat. And I remember being at Sundance, staying with. Um, I, it was either it's it was it was some like a festival, in in and. and for breakfast, just like having like six eggs and uh, like a pound of cheese and, and and like an entire salami and just sitting there going like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever felt this great in my life. And then at one point you start to feel like, I'm going to die. Like, like I just like my, my organs feel like they have like gone through 10 years in the span of like four weeks and you stop. But I had never felt... And my body reacted very well to it. I mean, at least, you know, like, I, I felt great, but yeah, then afterwards regular? you get scary. A medical report oh. issued by the New York ex- Medical Examiner's Office a year after his death showed that Atkins had a history of heart attack, congestive heart mm-hmm. failure, and hypertension. Mm-hmm. His widow refused to allow an autopsy. Right. There you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. But man, did he look good? Oh, did he, he look have good? A great looking horse. Good. I don't he was working. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the most American thing I've ever heard. It honestly was like it's it it it's like taking steroids. I was just like, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna eat breakfast and then I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna win today. I'm gonna eat breakfast and then I'm gonna make a situation in this movie that's gonna fucking destroy my dance. <laughs> I like that. It's you apply Shit, that. Just, that mentality. Who's the caboose is going to be number one? <laughs> you apply that mentality. I'm going to do the most offbeat eccentric comedy, which is a, a, like a meta critique of Hollywood that nobody's ever fucking seen before. Dogma 95, you can eat my dust. <laughs> Isn't that basically Joe Rogan's approach? The, yeah. Joe Rogan's, yeah. well, again, yes, but, but the paleo is definitely... I did paleo briefly, and you're supposed to eat way more greens and veggies. Oh, total. So it's not as insane. You don't as stay away Atkins. from carbohydrates. It's just you that stay you away stay from, from anything processed, and processed, anything processed foods. So you are not eating like. And there's specific oils too, right? You're not supposed yeah, to have like uh, olive oil. You're not supposed to cook okay with, with olive oil. No. You got to cook with like uh, like. They're okay with coconut oil. They're really into they're coconut, really into coconut oil. medium chain triglycerides. Right. Right. I so just... it's different. I don't know why anyone would think that people were healthier back when they died at like age 30. Right. 
I don't right. know. Read, uh, I don't know, Chris Ryan. He Read Chris that, Ryan. That no, that research is apparent. That that's it's a all whole, bunk. In fact, that's that you should be into this. That that the more cooperative indigenous societies had actually higher life expectancy than people write about and claim. And part of the uh, Hobbesian argument against those societies and undermining some of their values is the idea that they uh, that they lived uh, shorter and more brutal lives. That hmm. isn't necessarily true, according to new anthropological hmm. research. What does that mean? Isn't necessarily true. I mean, I take everything in both pro and con- like I take all of this with some grain of salt. I'm just saying the idea that salt, indigenous you take your paleo with what, is there a specific type of salt? It's deflated by like child mortality, right? It's bef- yeah, but when you salt, live, what people who who yes, but when right. they actually lived, they didn't necessarily die at 30, and they actually had pretty high and healthy life expectancy. But that's right. Not, so if you well, made it's it past, not about the if diet, you made it, though, made it past the age of, of 60, you're going or 50. Yeah. Yeah, but then and then the argument, right, right, yes. Well, regardless, if we want to solve climate change, people are not going to be able to be paleo Hobbs for long. Is wrong. I don't know about that. If you buy locally sourced stuff, but whatever. Well, yeah, but there's not enough. That's debatable. There's not enough. Like, there's not uh, enough locally sourced stuff. Right. That's true. Meat production's no, got to go down a lot. People will need to reduce meat production, no doubt. We'll make, but, we'll I mean, make it. We'll but make it's also it. Uh, not about chemically. Uh, yeah, just test tube. Produced. Yeah, test It's also not about me. people's I lifestyle. Fully decisions support lab either meat. Either way, though. Well, no, of course. But yes. How could lab meat be any more disgusting than eating meat meat? It's I mean, not. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's. It's meat is it's gross no matter how you get it. And I'd say this is someone who likes it. I feel likes like meat. It could, I, I find meat. it gross. It could I be more disgusting, but what if it's even what if it's less disgusting? Why it, of course it's less disgusting. The yeah, because you don't have to think about an animal like living in its own shit. Imagine or if you could just, just like, having to kill it. Imagine if you could just grow chicken nuggets like a chia pet. Well, the the fry part is gonna be the tough part. You would know. love That's that, wouldn't you, Matt? Like, how do you get it crispy and so, uh, Matthew, you still there? Hello. <laughs> Do you have a critique of lab meat based off of your? No. Can uh, I can I tell you how great this is? This is actually laying the groundwork for my suggestion today. Because uh, oh. I've, I've actually Perfecto. personally been. What's that? Perfecto. I had that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I've actually started, um, you know, I, I, I flirted with vegetarianism in, in my youth in college. I experimented. I remember um, that. But I always and felt... vegetarianism actually lodged a complaint, I think. Go ahead. Yes, it, it, but uh, no witnesses. So, um, uh, But I, I've actually started now coming back slowly to, you know, Mary is, is a, not a vegetarian, but she doesn't eat red meat, and I, I, I've been starting to kind of think that way. Um, but I saw a film recently that really kind of pushed me over the edge, just in terms of, you know, I, I, I've now, I feel like my, my sense of who a person is is expanding. This isn't like an environmental uh, decision or even a political decision, although it has those ramifications. Uh, you know, you, at a certain point, I think you start to realize, like, sentient animals, even if they're so delicious, they're kind of like, they're, you know, they're people. They, they, they have agency, and they kind of should not be eaten for food. Um, and, and I've started to think, you know, I also have two dogs, and it actually maybe it's weird, and it's that, like that Republican thing of, like, until it happens to you, you don't really, uh, you know, you can't extend your empathy. But it, it has happened that just having four-legged animals around me makes me feel like every four-legged animal that I see, I'm now extending the same feeling of, like, sentience and kind of value inherently so uh, i'm cutting out eating four-legged animals and this uh recently i saw this film that really just kind of uh, would tip the scales uh completely wasn't, wasn't frederick wiseman's meat was it no although that was definitely a chip in the foundation of because uh, that is a horrific that thing depiction is of brutal uh, Brutal. brutal, really brutal, and it's in there. You know, it's in. It's one of the bricks that made up this kind of uh, pedestal that finally I can see over you know the rest of my life what it, what it actually means to eat four legged animals. Um, but uh, I want I want to read a you a quote. Wait a second before yeah? we get into this. Why four legged? Yeah. Why why are you drawing the line of four legged? Like cause well, like I said, like I said, it's eat like chickens. You're a, fish are assholes. So wait a second. So you're a yeah. Fat, birds would kill us if they had the chance. No, no it's it, it's literally it's it's probably arbitrary, it's but it just feels true. like the first step. Right. That right. you know, right. like because uh, I see my dogs and my dogs are four legged. If I had a 
chicken as a pet, maybe I would feel this way too. And, and, and it is, like I have to admit, it's a kind of um, – selfishness of a convenience to not completely limit it to only vegetarian well, I mean, the, uh, the, the reason why we are uh, as a society anyways, and a lot of people are not, but the reason why as a society we're able to eat animals uh, that are not human beings as opposed to eating human beings is because we feel some type of kinship, uh, like some type of special kinship uh, with human beings. And I think it, it's conceivable. Right. It, so it's not that strange to me that you would become that empathetic. Although the the interesting flip side of that is the most, some of the most, um, I don't want to say a, a, aggressive meat eaters, but, 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 but I know a lot of people who um, who live on farms, and or yeah. or don't I don't live on like what you would consider a farm per se, but like have uh, you know a dozen or two dozen chickens. They raise a couple of pigs every um, you know they, they they get them in the spring, and then actually around now uh, they slaughter them for the winter. Um, they will uh, mm -hmm. hunt a deer. Uh, but they have all sorts of pets. They also have like three dogs and two cats that live in their house type of situation. Um, yeah. It's so, I mean, it's interesting, you know, particularly like in the, in, in the farm world, it's just sort of more like, I mean, not, this is not the case of every farm, but, um, in more rural areas, it's just like, oh yeah, you see that all the time. It's, uh, one animal kills another and eats it. Uh, I do not right. think I could deal with that. And that's why I don't eat meat except for fish sometimes. There you go. Like, if I couldn't kill it myself, nah, I don't feel like I should eat it. Fair enough. And, like, yeah, I agree you know, with I, you. That's, that, that makes total sense to me. And I, and I don't know. I can't speak to sort of what the farm experience is. Like, I, I admit I'm completely removed from where the food I eat comes from. So there is that kind of, like, uh, plausible deniability. And, and the more you understand it, I think, at least for me, the more I'm disgusted by it. And And it is that, like you said, that sense of, uh, of kinship, you know, and, and, and you know, it's funny, you guys, somebody, uh, I think it was when Michael was hosting, you mentioned Ken Wilber and his kind of like uh, 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 levels of development, and, and I'm reading this book he wrote about the era of Trump in the post-truth world, and his whole thing is like this spiral dynamics where you're kind of uh, growing from one stage to another, and each one is sort of more inclusive about who you feel is in your in-group, so at first it's just you know, it's just you, then it's your family, then it's like your, maybe your religion or your country, until eventually it's like everybody. And I, and I feel like adding animals to that is kind of where, where yeah. I'm sort of going, you know? Like, I, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, that makes a lot I, of sense. I think it's quite possible 50 years from now, uh, 60 years from now, people will look back on eating uh, animals in the same way that we look upon slavery. What people someone. will be looking back? I, I kind of think so. Yeah, I was going to say, we're donezo, baby. Well, <laughs> part of how we're going to not be donezo is ramping down meat production and maybe getting some really good meat substitutes because, like, vegetarianism is going to be a hard sell for a lot of people. That is I a think, I think you're very right, though, about just the kind of sense. Uh, it was super neoliberal. The market will uh, it was will stunning. Save us. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we're going to democratically incredible. plan production. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> And that will and we're going to get this all I'm done well aware, guys, down so within 12 years, no problem. Meat production. The, the, the state should be uh, financing all of that right now. The, the state is, uh, well, it's like everything else. The state starts it, and then yeah. it's privatized. That's how it works. Um, so, Matthew, and, and let's you know, get to your pick. Yeah. So It's so from it's Denmark. This film, it's this film that Netflix produced called Oaksha. Has anyone heard of it? Oaksha. It's like a, isn't John Ronson really, uh, somehow involved in this? Don't you mean okra? Is, no, that is the southern fried delicacy vegetable, which is delicious. It's I have also to say. an it is. Indian delicacy as well. But mm. no, this this is sandwich. by a Korean filmmaker Bong Joon Ho. He made movies like Snowpiercer and some other kind of uh, sort of dark sci-fi type movies. And this is, I think, one of the most incredible movies made in the past ten or fifteen years. It was released directly by Netflix. And it has uh, amazing actors in it that you know, like Tilda Swinton, Paul Dano, Stephen Yoon from Walking Dead, Jake Gyllenhaal. And it, it is in a mixture of English and Korean, so it's kind of a multinational production. But it is one of the most uh, affecting movies about 
factory farms, I guess you would say, but it's also that sort of selling it short because it is a kind of like if Spielberg made a film about the horrific conditions of factory farms. So it's got this kind of sort of idealistic side to it, but also this really cutting sort of sardonic uh, sarcasm uh, kind of, uh, you know, satire side to it. And I just want to read you a quote from the director who, who I think is amazing, uh, this quote. He, he said uh, when making this film, films either show animals as soulmates or else we see them in documentaries being butchered. I wanted to merge those worlds. The division makes us comfortable, but the reality is that they are the same animal. Uh, and, and he later in this interview he gives goes on to say, all of our problems arise because of capitalism. I was going to get there. It brings pleasure, but also so much pain and unhappiness. The questions I ask in my films about why we harm the environment or animals all comes down in the end to capitalism. So, and again, it's going to sound, I make it sound like it's this like intellectual political statement. It's this highly emotional, affecting, hilarious movie. And it's basically about this kind of super pig that in the future, this is sort of a not too distant future kind of movie that is developed by this corporation run by Tilda Swinton's uh, uh, sort of mustache twirling CEO. And it's about, you know, the, the, the fight of these, uh, both the owner of the pig who raises it and the members of this sort of uh, uh, corrupt but sort of well-meaning animal liberation front group who try to free it. And I don't want to tell you any more about it because it is just madcap, but it is also one of the most just, tear-stained viewings I have had in a long time. Wow. It, is, it is devastating uh, when you start to really fall in love with, you know, wow. the most charismatic animal ever to grace a screen, and it's a CGI creation. But Okja, is it as good as I babe? mean, obviously, it, yes, it okay. is as good right. as Babe. And, but it's got this sort of sci-fi political uh, sort of satire to it, which makes it, to me, uh, a, a cut above your, your normal animal wow. love. That actually sounds great. This sounds extremely relevant to my interests. That sounds amazing. Oh, well, good, good. Wow. Uh, so uh, Tilda it was Swinton mine, is and in it, a relationship. And it blew me away. And I think it really affected my choice of what to eat. I Like, a four legs, no go. That's, that's my new phrase. Have you well, ever been to the farm sanctuary in Woodstock? I have not. It's pretty cool. If you want another emotional experience with animals, I highly you know, recommend I it. I prefer fact, my experiences if, mediated by the screen, but if, I might do that. If you go uh, back and find uh, the That's Bullshit series uh, that I did uh, about six or seven years ago, I think it's still on our YouTube channel. The picture I of recall the, I did the opening. Yes, that picture of the bull is from the oh, yes. uh, animal uh, farm sanctuary up there. Uh, oh, okay. Was, uh, Interesting uh, tidbit for fans of that yes. bullshit. Now, I guess I, you know, I guess I, in retrospect, I exploited that bull. Uh, but not uh, the worst way it could have been exploited. But uh, yes, uh, not the worst. But I was up there. It's actually a very cute place to go up there. You, kids, uh, it's good for the kids. Tough to eat a pig after that. Um, well, I gotta say, Okja, it, it, uh, it literally, there's like a demarcation in my life before I saw Okja and after. So wow. uh, if that's if that's uh, enough to recommend it to you, I say well, uh, go for it. Matt's sitting there you, like, uh, these, uh, put me down comments. for a definitely not watch. Uh, but like uh, Matthew, uh, you, you already, <laughs> yeah. you, you, I mean, I feel like you sold that movie uh, to Jamie, and I, I'm, I'm going to watch that as well. Is it? Do me I want to watch it with the kids or no? Well, listen, the kids, it could change their lives. Like, I, I it will definitely be affecting. So it is dark. You know, there are some. Uh, scenes that are like just very hard to watch I if you watch love an animal. I, uh, uh, a you know, I so watch. it may, it depends. You know, I usually like to recommend the most horrible things for you to watch with your daughter. This right. one I may say, just check it out first yourself. All right. Well, uh, another, another thing I just want to say, uh, just to sell you on the filmmaker, he, you know, he, he, I'm made sold another already. Movie Take yes for an answer, for God's sakes. <laughs> All I'm right. Watch All it. right. You're right. I'll save it. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. I mean, I've got her up there. I, it looks intriguing. Okay. I like. The, I just I, wanted to tell you that he hates his parents, and and he puts that in the movies too. So all I right, I knew well that. sold, sold. All right, well done. It's about how, not eating animals and hating your parents. I'm going to watch right. that immediately at the satellite <laughs> apartment. And how do you uh, spell that? O K J A. O K J A. Yes. Okay. Bong Joon Ho. 
OKJA. And uh, all right. Well, Matthew, film guy, as always, a real pleasure. Yeah. Why don't you talk about your eBay uh, page one more time so that people can get over there? What is the what 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 is the the most exciting article? Uh, your top line article that you have on the eBay page right this moment. Well, I. I, I have sadly decided to let go my brand new with tags Christmas gift that I got from Mary, Adidas Cleveland Cavaliers number 23 LeBron James, same type that he wears in the games, tank top and short set. Why? You can get it Wait, for a what? low, low. Why are you gave doing that, that to you? And you what? What are, what are you doing? Because you know what? I don't go around dressing up like my heroes. Like it's just not my thing. Like, I love watching before, basketball. I love LeBron. Why would you do but, this before Halloween? There's your Halloween yeah, costume. You're LeBron. Jubron. Yeah, I you know, I don't know. I, it's just something I don't Does Mary know wearing you another put man's it on there? jersey. It's just not my style. Does Mary uh, you know, know you put it on there? What's that? Does Mary know you have it on eBay? She is not happy about it. I would bet. Wow, you're a prick, man. Jesus <laughs> Wow, and that's coming from Michael. But that's right. why I wanted to go to someone who exactly. can really give it a good home, take care of it, treasure it, because it was it was. Uh, My a fiance very got me gift. a bad gift. Would somebody in the rest of the country like to have it, give it right. a better home? Because I'll treat it with consistent contempt and disrespect because I don't wear my hero's jerseys while I'm watching Danish films about right. incest that are really about technology. <laughs> I'm Hello. so glad I graduated into the Saul Rosenberg voice too. I really feel great about that. Uh, Welcome aboard. You did when you were circumcised. Uh, That's right. Matthew, film guy. Thank it's you so much for your time today. Appreciate it, buddy. Uh, it's always funny. Thank you, Sam. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. See ya. Matthew, I really want to see that movie. Guy, ladies yeah, it and gentlemen. Yeah, sounds super good. It sounds really good. Do we have a uh, Jimmy Reefer Cake uh, song? We have a Jimmy Re- Reefer Cake and Adam Re- Rainstopper. Okay. Oh, so. yeah. Well, now, how do these guys hook up? Do we know the uh, I don't origin think we know. We need, a, this, we need a behind uh, the music. Power duo. Really, the uh, Lennon <laughs> to his a, McCartney. We need a behind the music. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's uh, let's hear. It. What's it called? It's called Saudi Arabian Killers by okay. Jimmy Bin Reefer Cake and Adam All Rainstopper. Wow! Oh right. boy, <laughs> I like it already.
there you go. I mean, I, um, we, Michael wanted to do a little fact checking of the song. It was Abdullah that he bowed to, not MBS. There unless go. there's additional photos. But uh, Abdullah gave him a fat MC Hammer style chain. Yeah, maybe Jimmy Reefer Cakes got access to some info that we don't have. And I will also I think say that's true. that. Um, Definitely. Citing uh, Tulsi Gabbard and um, and and um, and Rand Paul as if they were sort of lone dissenters in our support for Saudi Arabia, I think it's slightly uh, inaccurate. The in in 2017, the Senate vote to um, to not to to uh, not sell half a billion dollars worth of missiles to Saudi Arabia was 53 to 47. Uh, there were about four or five Democrats who I think um, uh, defected to the Republican side. And uh, I think Rand Paul was one of the Republicans. If there were more than one, I think it was maybe only one. And Mike Lee might have defected on it too, but Rand Paul. But why don't why don't you say listen to Chris Murphy and Bernie Sanders? Bernie Sanders has been speaking more clearly on Saudi and, Arabia than anybody. And well, with a, I think Murphy, uh, to be honest with you, has been there for a long time in Murphy's terms of been like. Very good. I mean, you know, Murphy's very in terms good. of like his that's his one trick. And no, Mur- I don't want to say that's his one trick, but that has certainly been his trick. Murphy's uh, very good, and I, but I just think it's really enraging to me. That especially now with this whole nonsense with Tulsi Gabbard, when Bernie Sanders really actually is, he is starting to articulate and piece together a full left foreign policy. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard has nothing to say about Lula. She has nothing to say about refugees. She has nothing to say about global oligarchy. I get that she's like a hero to the dum-dums, but there's still some problems there. I will, I will also say that even the House... In, oh, I guess this is in, in 2007. That was when the Democrats controlled the House. Uh, had voted to cut off aid to Saudi Arabia. I remember. I remember. So, I mean, this I is, don't this think is, so. Do you remember when? Uh, Who did that? You must have. You did it by accident. There's a ghost in the machine. Yeah. <laughs> I remember also when. Uh, I remember. I told you when uh, Mansion was on uh, with Jank. And Jank was asking him about funding the Saudis, and he's just like, "I'll tell you what, Janks, here's what I'd say about that. I don't think uh, they talk about take talk, talk about uh, collateral damage. It's not. It's killing men, women, and babies. That's wrong. I don't believe in that term. That's about killing innocent people. But I thought Janks, you know, if we had U.S. advisors telling them how to use these weapons, that'd probably be a good argument, maybe an opportunity to use them safer. So I thought it'd be better that we're part of the process. Nailed it. <laughs> I was constructive, watching that. Con- I was, <laughs> constructive engagement. Yeah. That's what I know. It's like, you know, if you're if we're not there with Boeing and Lockheed Martin, I don't think we're doing anything to help make that situation better there, Jenks. And I say, you know, on the field and off the field, whether it's the Supreme Court or setting up a cholera outbreak out there in Saudi. Jesus. You got anything for, else for me, you I goddamn guess. Turk? Because I go all day. I don't give a fuck. Pretty, pretty smooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Match it is that's the why he ultimate wins. BS artist. That is why he wins. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, just a reminder, this program relies on you, its audience, for its support. Hey, when you become a member, not only do you get the extra content, you get uh, the, uh, the free show commercial free. So today you, uh, you were treated to three commercials if you're a free listener. But if you were not, uh, if you were a member, we would be nine minutes. Right now you'd be nine minutes into the fun half. And I'm going to tell you right now what's going to happen in the fun half. We're going to take some calls, but I'm also going to go through Paul Ryan's complete, like the way that this dude lies about Medicare. Um, it shows the, the Republican desperation, but they have had luck with this in the past, folks. You remember the ACA. Uh, oh, this is exciting because the Paul Ryan material is going to lead to a new, a second plug for Sam's new book as well. What's, what was it? Blaming the electorate. Oh yeah, Sam that, Michael's very excited about. I that. am excited about that. I uh, like it. And um, all right, but uh, uh, so that's what uh, members are going to get. Uh, so you'd be nine minutes into it. You've already heard that if you were a member by now. I don't know how that's going to work in terms of time. I can't quite figure that out. But uh, folks, join the majority report dot com. It is uh, literally pennies. I mean, a significant number of pennies. Not not. I mean, so many pennies that you probably wouldn't want to walk around with these many pennies in your pocket. So in a way. 
we're doing you a favor when you become a member of the Majority Report. We're relieving you of walking around with 50 pennies in your pocket every single day. You are welcome. Also, uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Folks, today is Friday. That means that yesterday was Thursday. The day that preceded that would have been Wednesday, if I am not mistaken. The day before that is Tuesday. Tuesday uh, has a night. On Tuesday night is the Michael Brooks Show. And uh, who was here on Tuesday night? Alex Perrine. Oh, you I. had the sniffles, too, right? On I that had the day? sniffles. Right. Okay. Oh, well, not for my show. Right. Oh, you're, you're much to, healthier. And actually, you. I didn't even need to do sniffles because I texted you to say I was out. So I was fine. Uh, it, yeah. you listen, here's a little, uh, I'll give you a little tip, folks. If you're yeah. calling, if you're uh, texting uh, you know, your boss to say, I'm not coming into work, don't put Perrine's cough in between. <laughs> the, cough, the fake cough actually works. Much better when you're on the phone. Like, I can't come. <laughs> you don't write cough, 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 comma in parens. Sniff, in the text. I write cough, cough, sniffle, sniffle, wink. wink See yes. you later. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a real bad one. Um, we, we talked about what the Democrats would do if they actually wanted to win the long right wing grift that's blown up in all of our faces. This coming Tuesday, I know a Changa. Is going to be on. We're talking on the uh, from a ground perspective on the Georgia gubernatorial race, voter suppression, grassroots campaigns across the country, and this Sunday for patrons, an illicit history of the uh, Congo Civil War, going back to the assassination of Patrice Lumumba with Milton Alamadi, whose crew and an Africa scholar. Patreon.com/slash/tmbs. And uh, Jamie. So on this week's episode of the Antifada. We have a dialogue between Doctors Bones and Blumenfeld about the OG spookbuster himself, Max Stirner. There, there you go. <laughs> and for our patrons, as a special bonus, we have a bonus that just dropped today, where we get a little bit personal with our friend Jacob, who's an expat living in Berlin. Um, we talk about how he triggered none other than Alex Jones, Glenn Beck, and Steven Crowder with his translation of the book Communism for Kids, as well as his guerrilla reading of The Coming Insurrection at a Barnes & Noble. And uh, Matt, Literary Hangover? Literary Hangover, the f uh, completion of Volume 1 of Hope Leslie will be out tomorrow. It's a three-hour one, so if you're looking for some fiction to listen to, you can have you can listen to me read it to you. Uh, that's it. That's only if you're a Patreon at patreon.com slash literary hangover. All right, folks, going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. See you there, 646-257-3920, or you can IM the show through our app. Uh, which is uh, still uh, hopefully we're waiting for iTunes to okay it soon.
We are back. Just got an email. Somebody wanted us to point out that Okja, not on DVD, only on Netflix. Not sure why they felt so strongly about that, but they did, and that got, is... Got some DVD representers around. Accurate. Does Netflix not send you DVDs in the mail anymore? They, they, they do, but not all of them are available on DVD. Um, calling from a 210 area code, who is this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. It's John from San Antonio. Hello, John from San... I'm doing well. How are you, John? I'm good. All right. All right. The last call. The last call on Wednesday uh, said that any eligible voter in Texas can vote by mail. Uh, this is incorrect information. Uh, you can only vote by mail if you're 65 or older, if you're disabled, or if you're going to be away from uh, your voting location on November 6th and the, the period of early voting, uh, which is about two weeks. So if that's the case, you need to inform your uh, county voter organization and request a mail-in ballot. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry about okay, that. Okay. Uh, fueling the correction. It's all right. Okay. Uh, fueling increased uh, speculation about an upcoming 2020 run, a presidential run. Bernie Sanders is starting a nine-state tour while be stumbling for Democratic candidates. Uh, some of the some of the states that he'll be going uh, to is are uh, Iowa and Indiana. Will host a pair of town halls about cuts to Social Security. Uh, He'll be uh, campaigning for Amar Campanajar, who's running in the 50th district of uh, California. And he's been within the margin of error in three of the last four polls. He's running against Duncan Hunter, who's been indicted on 60 counts of felony crimes, including fraud. Well, uh, well, is, uh, facing well, well, let's be fair, John. Wasn't it his wife's fault? Uh, wasn't that what Duncan Hunter said? He threw yeah, his he wife did. under the bus about that? I listened to his interview. I yeah. was actually persuaded. <laughs> He's actually both of them have been, have been indicted. So, uh, and, and is facing a new round of election fraud charges over uh, filing forms that, where he claims he didn't know members of his extended family uh, work. You know, according to the uh, San Diego Union Tribune. So Bernie will also be stumping for Mike Levin, uh, who's endorsed by the uh, Progressive Change uh, Campaign Committee, and he is the, the overwhelming favorite to win in the 49th District in California, currently held by Daryl Issa. Currently had this race as the seventh most flippable district and is a must-win for Democrats. He's had a couple recent double-digit leads in polls, and the uh, National Republican Congressional Committee has uh, taken their money from this race, so essentially it's, uh, it's over. Uh, so, uh, so on uh, October 22nd, Bernie will be in uh, Wisconsin uh, endorsing Tammy Baldwin and Randy Bryce. Uh, he's also stumping for our revolution endorsed uh, J.D. Shulton, who's running against the odious racist uh, Steve King, who won this district in 2016 by 23 points. In his last poll, King is only up by six points, and Democrats are favored to pick up seats in, and uh two seats in Iowa, the, the first and the third district. So Iowa might flip from a 3-1 Republican uh, advantage to a 3-1 Democratic right. advantage. So Bernie's also stumping for Liz Watson in Indiana, ninth district. And you were talking about Jared Polis, who's running the governor in, in uh, Colorado. He, he's rated 104 on progressive punch and 72 among the uh, the, the Trump uh voting record he's 72nd as far as the best democrats voting so essentially he's, he's more of a centrist democrat a little bit surprised bernie supporting him but you know he's he's good on many issues it's also like you were talking about gretchen widmer he's he's also going to be campaigning for her uh she's had a lead of about 10 points in polling and should be a pretty easy victory for her uh David Garcia, who's running in for governor in Arizona, is kind of in the, the opposite situation. He's been down by about 12 points in his run, so that's a pretty hard task there. Big surprise is that uh, Bernie's stumping for conservative Democrat Jackie Rosen, who has a terrible voting record, but is a, it's a crucial must-win race if Democrats have any chance of winning the Senate. So if you want to comment on anything, and then maybe I can talk a little bit about the, the house odds if you want to. Well, I'll comment. He's a fucking sellout. Well, I know. I mean, I was actually going to comment on that uh, on on that, that race as well. I mean, look, the 
the reality of the reality of our um, our situation is um, is that we need more Democrats in the Senate, if only to take one or two votes. <laughs> You know, I mean, literally to make a difference in one or two votes to slow the tide of I mean, this is what what is so infuriating to me. And I know you didn't bring this up about Chuck Schumer is like the idea is that the value of having the Senate really is. Well, there's more to it than this as well. But the value of having the Senate is to stop this uh, flow of judges and, you know, uh, it seems pretty short-sighted to increase the flow of judges to stop the flow of judges. I understand the theory. I just think it's um, uh, uh, I think it's wrong in this instance. But so good for Bernie. I mean, he uh, he understands the the value of that. I mean, and it's his way of basically saying, uh, I realize that um, you know. Uh, uh, horses can't fly and uh, that there are certain realities to uh, governance that is it cannot be just uh everyone is not who i want them to be <laughs> and that's the bottom line i mean you know uh harry reed came into the senate i don't know if he actually came into the senate with this but um was uh you know anti-choice and he sucked it up he didn't vote that way as a or, or in, and didn't function that way as a senator but i mean he was anti-choice essentially and so uh, rosen's important uh to beat uh, heller in in nevada i'm sorry it's just the the reality yeah i mean I, i'm a little bit surprised that she would actually have him campaign you know for him because you know it's just you know all the negative things that we all know are false about bernie he's still uh, popular but i mean you know yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's probably why she's doing well, it. But it's it, not it, it just, is a bit of a surprise. It's though. not just that, too, because she it is a recognition that she needs union members and she needs the base to come out. I mean, that's the that's the dilemma for, you know, some like, you know, for uh, I think that's why Heitkamp voted uh, against Kavanaugh. Because she made the calculation that the loss of the base would be far too devastating and I could not overcome that. I might be able to overcome it with some of the marginal uh, people from the Republican Party, but I cannot overcome it with the, the Democratic base. I need them fully engaged and motivated. And if, you know, like we're on the right track, if that's the calculation that people are making, if Jackie Rosen knows that she cannot get elected, without the base of the Republican Party, and to the extent that there's any concern, at least some conventional wisdom that you would um, alienate, you know, potential independent voters or swing voters or Republican voters by having Bernie Sanders there, it means that she understands that even if that's the case, it's more important for me to deliver uh, the labor base, particularly in Nevada, uh, to to come out and, you know, not just vote for her, but to sort of organize for her. But, John, as always, appreciate the call, buddy. All right, thank you. Right. Second vote out of fucking fear. <laughs> the reason horses can't fly is because of fucking fear. <laughs> well, that's probably true. I mean, it's at least partial, part of it. Wilbur, don't jump off that cliff. I don't know. You I say fly. jump off the fucking cliff, and maybe <laughs> then you sprout wigs, then we fucking fly, Jimmy's, and we're not caught in the fucking stable. Uh, I'm imagining but that's that, just me, but I don't make decisions. Mother's, mother's the, the, I mean, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I'm maybe imagining if, uh, uh, if you jump off the cliff, you'll develop uh, wings. Well, that is the idea, right? I guess. <laughs> I'm imagining a Pixar movie about bison, and they're all being chased off of a cliff. And Jimmy, there's a Jimmy door by and it's like, nah, it'll be fine. Let's just run over this thing and, and fight from down there. All right, let's. Except, no, no, he's like a bird on a tree, All telling right, them to do too it. Too early in the uh, in the fun half to get to something like this right now. I'd go on a, di a, a divergent because I want to get to this uh, Paul Ryan stuff. Um, so it is clear that the Republicans are afraid of Medicare for all. Not just they're they're not afraid. I mean, they're, of course, they're afraid of it as a, a policy prescription. 
but it has incredible salience as a political issue, right? Donald Trump gets out there, writes an op-ed full of lies. Here's Paul Ryan getting up in front of the National Press Club. Uh, I guess this was yesterday. Also, de delivering out the lies, and I have to say that, like, I want you to be very careful as, I mean, uh, listen carefully to how Paul Ryan juxtaposes these sentences. Like he is playing off the ignorance that is not only in the Republican Party, but frankly across uh, the electorate as to what Medicare is. You know, we, we've heard those stories where Republicans are saying, you know, get the government off of my hands, off of my Medicare. And this is more of that in many respects. And it is incumbent upon all of us and media outlets and, and to explain that government's not hands are not only all over Medicare. Government, the, its entire body is all over Medicare. It actually emanated from government. Your communion with government. Indeed. And here is uh, Paul Ryan lying and practicing, you know, how Republicans are going to try and push back on the idea of Medicare for all. They now call it Medicare for all because it sounds good. But in reality, it actually ends Medicare in its current form. Pause it. Now, Paul Ryan years ago came out with a proposal to privatize Medicare. And the Democrats push back by saying it's not Medicare. And Paul Ryan said, no, I call it Medicare. And the press also sort of bought, well, he does call it Medicare. It is Medicare. It's just changing it. And people were like, well, but the essence of Medicare is that it is government provided health insurance. And if you privatize it, it is no longer that. So it is not Medicare in its present form. It is expanded Medicare. I mean, this is why, like, you know, when, you know, there is value in, in sort of the, the way you present this stuff. Like, Medicare for all could just be Medicare Part A, let's say. We're going to call it Medicare Part A. Medicare for all. I mean, just so that he can't do these rhetorical tricks. Because people, frankly, are not savvy about this cue my book blame the electorate but i uh, continue with uh, paul ryan it ends private insurance altogether all right pause it. so he juxtaposes it's not medicare as we know it it ends private insurance as we have it all together implying that medicare is private insurance now there is um there is a component of medicare which is private insurance that is the Medicare Advantage program. That was shrunk for the, from the ACA because they were getting overpaid, but the d services delivered were not shrunk. And Medicare for all, incidentally, it's very unlikely that it would end all private insurance. There could conceivably be uh, private insurance that is issued in as a supplement to Medicare for all. Certainly we have that in places like France, just about every place that has a Medicare for all type program, a single payer, there is a supplemental private insurance if people want that, uh, wealthy folk. It's called BUPA in the UK, apparently. BUPA? I'm not sure what it stands for, the British something. Okay, blah, blah, but blah. So, so, but again, Medicare for all resolves a lot of the issues of Medicare, the, almost the idea of Medicare for all is to get rid of private insurance. But can I it ends private insurance altogether, including for the roughly 180 million people who count on health insurance coverage through their employer. Everyone, no matter how much you like your plan, would have their plan taken away. Instead, you will be put into a government-run plan where you have no say in the cost or in the coverage. Pause it. Oh, well, you do have a say in the cost uh, insofar as it won't cost you anything. Now, you could theoretically say, I want it to cost more, but that would be very atypical of an individual. And in terms of the plan, there is no plan. There's, a, you're not, there's no plan insofar as you're not limited. 
you get to see all doctors because they all take Medicare. <laughs> because what else are they going to do? Continue. Obamacare meant fewer choices. Medicare for all means no choices, no competition. Pause it. That's right. You won't have to make any choices. It will, you'll, all, you'll just be able to do what you want to do in terms of seeing your doctor. Obamacare, uh, limited choices because it's based on private insurance. Continue. How much do you get charged for this? That's a good question. A nonpartisan study found that a single payer program. It's a great question because you won't know what you're going to get charged for it because you're going to get it's zero is the answer. You'll be charged zero. Maybe there will always be like a copay, like a $20 copay. I think uh, when I was in Australia, visiting Australia 20, 30 years ago, uh, they had a, a similar style program. And uh, I'd go see a doctor and I'd have to pay like 12 bucks. I wasn't a citizen. I was just going in to see the doctor. Go ahead. Nonpartisan study found that a single payer program like this would cost the government a whopping $32.6 trillion over the next 10 years. Just to put the price tag of this idea in perspective. Pause it. Let me, let me put it in perspective for you. The Mercatus study that he's referring to, Mercatus, $32.6 trillion over the next 10 years. I will be able to put that into perspective for you. That is $2 trillion less than that study says we will, as a nation, spend on health care if we don't go to a single-payer uh, thing. So it's, it's just, it is um, almost like 8% less. We'll have 8% savings on what the national cost, the, na the, the nation as a whole, private and public sectors, will expend on health care. So it's, a, it's an 8% savings. How's that for a perspective? We could double all federal taxes, yours, mine, families, businesses, everyone's taxes, and still not be able to pay for this. The only way you could control costs would be to ration care and restrict access to doctors and treatments. All of these decisions would be made in Washington, of course. Um, this is absurd. What what does that mean? Ration care in this context, the care is there. That's not there's not there's nowhere else to go. You're not saving it for anybody else. Does he think that care isn't rationed now by the market? Care is of course rationed now, and what he's talking about is you're going to actually by rationing it means like the doctors may not get paid as much. Yeah. Plus the costs would go down because when you have one payer, right? The government, uh, they can say, they can tell the drug companies to charge less and they don't have a exactly. choice. The, it's like the, deal or no deal. The ration, uh, the, the rationing is, um, first of all, I think he's, he's lying about the, um, the double the federal taxes. Uh, I think if you double federal taxes, I think we pull in about $3.5 trillion annually, somewhere around there. And uh, I think people can do the math. 10 times 3.5 is actually $35 trillion. Um, now, of course, people will be saving more um, because they expend that in terms of private care. But that doesn't even imagine like the increase in productivity that we would get under a single pair. Uh, pay I mean, like, I don't know. How many hours a week, a month, does someone spend on dealing with their health care? Four, five, six hours a month, maybe more. What about all these, the doctors and the, all the paperwork? I mean, the anxiety too. And the anxiety. So the anxiety, uh, the worry. But there's uh, Paul Ryan. They are nervous about uh, the the not only the policy of uh, Medicare for all, but they are nervous. It is a winner for Democrats, and that is why. I would imagine, I don't know this for a fact, but anecdotally, I think probably a majority of Democrats running for office now are, are embracing Medicare for all. What, what that means individually to each one of them, I don't know, but that is a nice starting point 
uh, for this election. Well, in the lead into the Trump call on Fox and Friends yesterday, I think one of the Fox and Friends said that it was the number one issue basically everywhere. Healthcare is is the issue that everybody seems to be running on. Finally. And this is so much better than the ACA was because some of those Republican attacks on the ACA stuck. They were valid. It was still really expensive to get health care in the marketplace. And it didn't cover a lot. Like, I didn't like my plan that I could only afford because, full disclosure, my parents were helping me pay for it that I was forced to buy. Like, it sucked. So, like, you can't make those attacks on Medicare for all. It's so simple. And it's so clear. Uh, they're, they're, I think, extremely nervous uh, uh, of, of something like that being rolled out. Uh, Vispa. Hey, girl, swipe right. I have a Toulouse-Lautrec clown costume that incorporates a $200 Wyatt Coke Hawaiian shirt in my satellite apartment where I can sit on my Casper mattress and drink cider while I read you my Charlie Kirk debate point flashcards. Do you see? Uh, Paterno of Cuckatude. Plans to talk about ethics investigation to Kavanaugh. Merrick Garland recused himself for the Kavanaugh's ethic violation. They gave it to Roberts, who sat on it until Kavanaugh was confirmed. He then forwarded to the 10th District's uh, Tim Mikovich is on the same short list Kavanaugh was on and was appointed by Bush in 2003. Guess when, uh, who was White House counsel? Kavanaugh, who helped Timovich get his seat on the bench. Another sham investigation. Uh, what does a guy have to do uh, to do to get a Jamie Thursday? Left his best, smash the fash, down with the patriarchy. Tune into the Antifada. Uh, Contagious Chameleon. Is H. John Benjamin's book, there's a character named Bart Cedar who vomits from drinking several <laughs> times during Beach Week at Revia Beach. Is this character meant to re- represent you, Sam? I have no idea what you're talking about. California Uberales, uh, the Jordan Peterson diet. You're placed in a cage alone with a deer. Outside the cage is your government assigned female copulation partner wearing a traditional <laughs> German drindle. Uh, you must use your primal hierarchical urges and the power of myths to dispatch the deer with your bare hands and claim your lady prize. Sizzle chest. I've recommended it before, but please check out the gateway bug to see why our food production is unsustainable and the importance of including insects as protein sources. Uh, weird and futuristic. So cool to think about how we'll eat in the near distant future. It's streaming on Prime right now. Jeff from Oliver. Uh, was Sam the other guy in John Benjamin's Devil Triangle threesome story? No, it was not me. Um, I know who it was. Uh, so there is actually a story like this? Blind oh, yes. items. Oh, oh, yeah. No, it's in his book. It's disturbing. I would, I I'm not going to read it. remember him uh, calling me almost immediately after that. Sab, I got to share this with you. I don't remember who the woman was, but I do know who the guy was. And I've seen the guy at a reunion. Uh, not this most recent one, but uh, one. Nice. My Way to go. And I will, say, weird I, will say, I will say this, too. Um, I don't want to reveal too much, but when the guy told me what he was doing, I, you know, he told me that like five or six years ago. Uh, and then uh, Benjamin came out with a story. I was like, oh, good. I mean, if that guy in any way felt in any way... Like the, what the guy was doing was like basically exporting the worst of security measures to repressive regimes. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. It was really oh. Hard. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. And I'm like, is, isn't that bothering Was he Israeli? No. Hmm. No. Nope. Attorney Andrew. Uh, yesterday I listened to Mehdi Hassan's interview with Ro Khanna, Jeff Merkley, Nina Turner, and Simone Sanders on the Deconstructed podcast. He asked the panel how they'd approach court packing. You know what? Ro Khanna had a great thread on this on Twitter, and I, and I would like to talk to him about it. In response, Ro Khanna hurriedly suggests that Kavanaugh or other judges don't need to be impeached because with simple legislation, Congress could just move them to a lower court. He proposed by uh, making artificial uh, term limits with a simple legislation by saying once you reach a certain term, you get moved to a certain co- uh, circuit court. That's a great idea. Uh, that strikes me as unconstitutional because the Constitution is pretty clear. Lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court. But needless to say, I like the creativity. Wait a second. Does the, does the Constitution say lifetime uh, appointments? I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. For yeah, they could, Court. they could add term limits without amending the Constitution, I believe. Um, uh, somebody check on that. Bernie's plan has no copies. It's 100% uh, free at the point of service. Hell yeah. Auto to chat. 
Sam and crew, check out Chapo Trap House's YouTube video on conservative cartoons and cartoonists. Hilarious uh, piece and good listen. One can learn a lot for conservative humor or the lack of it. Good show. Um, loud. What's going on here? Loud. Uh, loud Bob's Natura. You guys better stop what you're doing and uh, watch a trailer for Okja. It's totally relevant to our interests. Uh, the Constitution provides that judges shall hold their offices during good behavior, but it doesn't say anything more specific than that. Hmm. And does it say uh, on the specific court? Maybe that's the idea that Roe Kahana has, is that if you keep them in the judiciary, the nature of their jobs is not... I mean... Uh, their nature of the, uh, you know, as long as they're still a judge. I don't know. Sam's Tinder bio. Hey, girl, you've heard me talk about Casper Sleep System. Swipe right if you're interested in another package. That double in. Okay. <laughs> calling from an 848 up. area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Sean from Jersey City. Uh, Sean, uh, could you stop talking in the, uh, the cup that you're talking to? Could you talk to us on your phone, please? Sure, Sam. Okay, thank you. So I saw the interview with uh, Professor Carol Anderson at the beginning of the week. Yes. Thought it was great stuff. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so I was thinking about as a counter to some of the voter suppression we're seeing as a uh, uh, compulsory voting. How do you feel about that? What kind of hurdles would uh, we have aside from the Supreme Court? Well, I mean, it could be the Supreme Court, uh, frankly. I mean, I, I I think it could be the Supreme Court. I don't know. I, I, I don't know why you couldn't pass. I mean, I guess you I, I mean, I guess you could structure it very similarly to um you know, some type of uh, tax that you're subject to, um, that you get a rebate on that tax if you vote. And I mean, if you can do that, if you can compel, you know, if you can compel people to buy private, a, a private product to actually expend money on, um, on, uh, on health insurance, um, in, in, in the form of it being, you know, sort of a, uh, a tax rebate, essentially, or deduction uh, if you get the health insurance, then I don't know why you couldn't do that with voting. Um, I, uh, I, I think compulsory voting would be good if we, if we combined it with moving it to like a weekend and or, and or uh, all, no, and I should say also uh, allowing for early voting or perhaps, uh, you know, voting by mail. So I'm, I'm, right. I'm all for that. That's good. Well, just removing all of the measures that keep people from voting would be quite helpful on the way to there too, don't you think? Sean is totally yeah, for um, uh, 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 obstacles to voting, but yes. No, like oh, we're so we're so <laughs> far away. We have like the opposite of that right now. <laughs> he said, right, like, he, that was very dead appreciate was the good. call, Sean. <laughs> appreciate the call. I, I don't see why you couldn't do that, uh, at least in, why I couldn't. It, like, I don't make like it a holiday, the idea man. of putting it on the individual citizens to vote. Uh, I'm much more into the idea of things at the policy level that make it easier for them to do so. You know, why not? We compel people to pay taxes. Uh, yeah. And I don't like that either. Oh, all right. Well, there you <laughs> I go. Mean, Sounds libertarian. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm being facetious. Like, it's always better to do things on the policy level than on the level of lifestyle politics or trying to shame individual people or, like, this coerce is not them. compulsory. Or, uh, well, it is coercive, way. but it's not, that's not lifestyle politics at all. And no. it's definitely... In a place like Brazil, it's not saying it's, you should make a choice. It's reason not saying that you should make a why um, Lula and Dilma were elected. Yeah, you're not. It's not. It's not. You're not making a choice. You're not. You're not forcing people to make a choice in terms of lifestyle. You're compelling them to do something that is like uh, one of the obligations of being a member, uh, being a citizen. You need to pay taxes. You need to. Uh, 
You need to get a social security card. You actually don't really actually need to do that. Uh, so I do, you exciting. can so not, uh, sort of uh, Man, avoid that. But I don't want to spend my time card. browbeating people who don't vote. It's not a browbeat. You literally you just be legislation. Anybody. You don't have to do anything. Just legislation. It's simple. It's easy. Don't see what it's going to do for them. But eh, agree to disagree. Um, well, you, you you could and then just uh, pay a, 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 a tax penalty. Um, I would be into it if you could get an exemption if you showed you participated in at least one direct action that year. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. Here's a picture of me Look. at a protest. You can't see it too well. There was about 20 of us and we were banging drums. Can I not vote now, please? Listen, we can all sit around here and joke, but um, there are horrible stories about... Uh, what is happening to individuals in this country, uh, to immigrants in this country. No, I'm not talking about the New Yorker story of the five-year-old girl from Honduras who was coerced to the extent that you can coerce a five-year-old from signing away their rights uh, to a judicial hearing. Like, I don't even know if you can like call that coercion. It's like taking rights away from a baby. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we will get to that story. It is a shocking story of the uh, of the the kidnapping, the, the kidnapping that we're doing. I mean, we, you know, we do it nicely. We we get the kid to sign her name on a piece of paper. Um, with uh, having a five year old myself, the idea of this is just repulsive. That's not um, this five year old girl from Honduras is not the only other immigrant who is uh, being uh, subjected to um, horrible things. Uh, there's another immigrant to this country who's also been subjected to unimaginable hardship and picking on. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about the First Lady, Melania Trump, sitting down with ABC News. What is it about social media? Because I remember you talking about this during the campaign. What happened to you personally? Or what did you see personally that you thought you wanted to tackle this issue? I could say I'm the most bully person on on the world. You think you're the most bullied person in the world? One of them, if you really see what people are saying about me. You're an adult. You say you're strong. Okay, pa 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 you could no. literally say anything. I just would like to add that. Right. You could but, then, but then he, then the ABC interviewer questions it. Out of, and, and it, 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 it's one of those questions where it's almost like, you don't need to be a reporter with any experience in the world to do that. It's literally like he couldn't stop himself from asking that question. It almost seemed like, like I'm this sorry, is could a you, softball could interview. You, could you clarify? Like, I, I'm sorry. Did I misunderstand what you said? Did you say that you were the most bullied person in the world? And then she backed off it. I'm up there. One of. <laughs> one of the most Top bullied. ten. I mean, top one ten. One of the most bullied. Listicle of bullied. One of the most bullied. I mean. This. Honestly, like right that is report. super stunning. Now, maybe if he'd asked another question, like, do you feel bullied from your husband? <laughs> maybe some of this might uh, come into a little How clarity. can you bully someone you ignore all the time? Exactly. Right, but uh, let's go back. You thought you wanted to tackle this issue. I could say I'm the most bully person on, on the world. You think you're the most bullied person in the world? One, one of them. If you really see what people are saying about me. You're an adult. You say you're strong. Have you thought about what would this do to a child, to my son, to other children? That's why Pause I... It. I mean, in other words, in other words, um, what, what if you actually were bullied? Uh, like, would that be hard for you? Or, um, and uh, instead it turns out to be like a, a nice softball question for her to promote this is what I'm doing but folks look um, she's going to talk about her Be Best uh, program <laughs> I think she came up with that name herself Be Best the other children that's why I you know my Be Best initiative is focusing on um, social media and online behavior we need to educate the children of uh, social emotional behavior so when they pause it i will say this and i think this is um this is this is i i have to credit her with this i have a five-year-old son and uh literally i can simply say that's mean don't be like donald trump 
and he understands what that means. I mean, to a certain extent, he's been very educated by this uh, to the extent where you know that uh, you don't want to be mean because you don't want to be like uh, Donald Trump. Continue. Social emotional behavior. So when they grow up and they know how to deal with, with those issues, that's very important. Um, also with opioid abuse, we have a big <laughs> crisis in United States. Wait, what? Every day I am struggling not to take opioids because of majority report ski who make fun <laughs> of me every day. And I want to do opioids, but I am strong woman. Also, anybody who wants to feel sorry for her, she was uh, right there in lockstep about the birther stuff, and she's done a number of other Would horrible things. Would you stop oh, bullying yeah. me, you big head Dakota man? It's very <laughs> mean. Everyone is bullying me every take, time. Take opioid, <laughs> guy. Take yes, maybe because if you are not from an opioid state, you would be nicer. Wow. <laughs> I like how she threw in opioid. <laughs> yeah. I oh. forgot I was supposed to say yeah. opioid crisis. Be best. Oh. Be best. By be best, I mean don't bully and don't take opioid. Here are the two steps to being best. Number one, you don't bully someone on Snapchat or Instagram. And number two, you don't do opioid. And then you will be part of best. Just say no. Oh, forget it, uh, bullied. Just say forget about it. Just f forget about it. Uh, I was supposed to be retired safely in the Azores two years ago. And never see this fat orange man again. Do you think But now I'm talking about bullying. Do you think there's a chance I will ever even come back to America before we're out of the White House? Could I, is it possible I could just keep going to different places? Where else is there also? Africa? What else? He makes them Where else start the car so it blows the fumes in my face when I walk around. I'm going to spend the next, <laughs> next three months in Vienna telling everyone to be best. Yes, just yes. to be best, be best. But not like Beyonce best. I'm tired of uh, the cultural politics. Speaking of people that you should have no sympathy or respect for, here is um, Jeff Flake, still on his conservative reformation project. This is nothing. This has nothing to do with the Republican Party. Uh, everything that we have witnessed over the past couple of weeks, nothing to do with the conservative movement. It is all. There is only one element. There's only one thing wrong with what's been going on with our government, and that is. Uh, just Donald Trump, who incidentally, as you recall, was uh, dropped out of a metaphorical helicopter and fell into the presidency without any help from all of those Republicans whatsoever. One final question, because you were in New Hampshire. Are you thinking about running for president? Um, you know, every senator <laughs> thinks of that. Some not very seriously. I'm probably one of those. Uh, Having said that, I do hope that somebody does run in the primary against the president. I think that Republicans need to be reminded of what conservatism really is and what it means to be decent. Pause it. Um, what vote, what vote has Jeff Flake taken that has not been uh, aligned with Trump's agenda that expresses the true conservatism? Also, could he fit any more pictures of his family uh, in the shot behind him? <laughs> right. I mean, give me a break. There is no conservatism. There is the, what what is conservatism? It is it is like that I mean, Latin exists. Latin exists, but nobody speaks it. It's a dead language. Conservatism is a is a is a dead ideology. It doesn't really exist in the world. It's just it's perpetual simply, reaction. It is. It is. It is simply a, um, a a label for a a, a set of policies that are um, uh, at its root sort of just fearful of anyone that is different from themselves in some way. Well, uh, it it preserves hierarchy, right? It, I hope Flake is, runs for president, though. That, that would be right. hilarious. That just Speaking maintains... of hierarchy and dominance displays, yes, watching exactly. Donald Trump do some, that, that flake for the 2020 primary would be pretty funny. Uh, that maintains a hierarchy that um, is uh, fundamentally, uh, though, you know, I mean, the, the hierarchy is, is, it's not even, it's not a generic hierarchy, right? Like, it's not like they like hierarchy for the sake of hierarchy. It is so that essentially white men like Jeff Flake uh, can be on top. 
Now they're willing to make some trade-offs here and there, and um, uh, but uh, that that's basically it. And there, outside of that, there is no other conservatism. And and Jeff Lake must, surely must understand this now, because he's seen the entire conservative, uh, so-called conservative movement. That is their organizing principle. It's not about deficits or not spending. If that's the case, there is not a single conservative in the Republican Party. Uh, maybe there's a couple. We don't know if they're re they're, we don't know if they had the ability to stop anything that they would actually vote that way. But the vast majority of the Republican Party doesn't care what Jeff Lank thinks is conservatism. They are motivated by and it's just I don't know how anybody could argue otherwise. Well, He's got an incentive to pretend that it's something else because uh, somebody just sent me a video of Jeff Flake uh, speaking in support of apartheid in 1987. Oh, yeah. Anybody, no, he was a lobbyist anybody for the in apartheid Republican, government. Anybody wow. in Republican politics uh, supported or was on the wrong side of the liberation. And uh, Jeff, Flake, uh, Jeff Flake voted with Trump 84% uh, of the time. Uh, he did not vote with Trump on immigration bans. And apparently with uh, Gina Haspel at the CIA. Um, Here's the difference. I was polite when I said that Nelson Mandela should stay in prison. Right. And ANC should be banned and that black South Africans should be systemically murdered and repressed. But I never I said specifically to never use the term coolly while we did it. Right. So uh, uh, according to now, is there any issue Beyond, I mean, that is greater in the imagination of the um, the 95 percent of Republicans who voted for Donald Trump than uh, his immigration stuff. I mean, honestly, like, you know, I got news for Jeff Flake. If he thinks there's conservatism, guess what? He's not one. He's just a corporatist who's mad about the immigration policies that they may some down, uh, you know, uh, chip away at low cost labor. He also named his most recent book The Conscience of a Conservative, which is Barry Goldwater's book. Right. Barry Goldwater, of course, said, uh, moderation in protection of liberty is no virtue. Extremism in defense of freedom is no vice. So this is what that party is. And, and remember what freedom who, meant yeah, exactly. at that time. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I can, have I, mean, a, I can have a lunch counter and I have to serve black right. people. Freedom, at and, 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 and Goldwater was actually a pioneer of the... I'm absolutely not racist. And if he, he literally had the perspective of some idiot that would call on this show. Like, I'm not personally racist, and it's bad for business. But if we tell the South to stop empowering paramilitary terrorist organizations and systemically oppressing black people, that would be antithetical to freedom. Yeah, I agree with the second part, right? Like, extremism in defense of freedom, A-OK. -okay. Just have a different definition of freedom. Right. Um. This is uh, this is pretty impressive. Uh, Steve Mnuchin um, has okay. decided that he will not in any way uh, cancel his trip uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for uh, meetings. Um, and because, look, what is one killing and chopping up of a uh, columnist between friends? That's basically it. Can I ask you um, about a, a slightly different issue? And it's, it's one that is vexing um, a lot of executives at the moment. And they've got to make a decision about whether they travel to Saudi Arabia for the FII event. Currently, as I understand it, you are scheduled to go. But even as we speak, you hear leaders elsewhere pulling out of the event. Are you still determined uh, that you will attend at this point, given that there is still, um, I think, no clarity as to what has happened to Mr. Pause uh I think there's some clarity. I think we're pretty much in the clarity realm of what happened. I mean, so, you know, maybe this guy's giving him a slight uh, out here. There's, you know, we don't know what happened. We suspect that he was murdered and chopped up. There's apparently audio and video of it. But maybe he spontaneously combusted. It feels like he's consciously keeping the uh, CNBC viewers in the dark a little bit. A little bit. But let's hear. Let's give Steve Mnuchin uh, an assessment. To what has happened to Mr. Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist. Well, first, let me just say uh, we, we are concerned about. 
is the status of Mr. Khashoggi. And uh, although I haven't had direct conversations with the Saudis, I know other people within the executive branch have, and those discussions are underway. Uh, I am planning on going at this point. If more information comes out and changes, uh, we, we could look at that, but uh, I am planning on going. And what would your advice be to, to executives uh, in the United States and elsewhere who are asking themselves the same question about whether they should be attending? Well, my comment is we all want information, so let's, let's wait and see what information comes out in the next week. Are you concerned at all that there may be any wider damage to the relationship with that country as far as the U.S. is concerned or any economic implications? Well, Saudi has been a very good partner of ours in a lot of areas. Matter of fact, one of the reasons why I'm going over there is last year we started the terrorist financing targeting center with all mm. the Gulf countries, and it's based in Saudi. We co-chair it with them. I'll bet it's uh, I've based committed in to Saudi. Go back over at least once a year and work with them on this. So that that's another major focus of my trip, and they've been a terrific partner in combating terrorist financing with us. Really, really, have they? Based upon, since when did you've, that happen? You've come to the right place. Yes. <laughs> my you know, friends, my friends. Go, my, we're, going to, we're going to combat terrorist financing. We're going to shut down our banks three days a week. Bank holidays. Bank holidays. That's going to be the friend, first thing we do. My friend, for you, we, I will behead your wife. <laughs> we will cut the financing by a 10% for you. But these I terrorists <laughs> who chop these people up. I mean, honestly, but it is like, barbarism. It is total barbarism. Do you think? I mean, I, it's too I, bad Mnuchin couldn't have the the frankness of Trump and just say like, "There's too much money involved. We get too many friends. We make we, got, we have like arb sales, okay?" But I also, but you know, it reminds me of though there was something in a disgusting way refreshing about Trump being like, "What you think we're angels?" and a little bit of sort of honesty about the amorality of U.S. foreign policy. Conversely, though, this is the type of thing which really underscores in international relations manners actually mattering because it's like this is the type of thing that, yes, if they murdered and dismembered a journalist under Obama, they'd cancel some meetings <laughs> like and they also wouldn't feel on top of everything else, we could murder and dismember a journalist I, I, in an embassy. I'd, I, I, it absolutely yeah. facilitate. I mean, even even if you want to try, I mean, the guy calls the press the enemy of the people all day. Yep. yep. Let's take it literally. That's all MBS is yep. doing. I am taking your ideas seriously. All right, let's talk about this story. This is super disturbing. And it's indicative of, you know, there are more and more people who are digging into stories of the family separations. Um. This is, um, I mean, this suggests that, the, you know, the family separation still probably and maybe in some respect. Well, certainly there are still, I, I, again, I, I shouldn't even call it family separation. This is kidnapping. And there are more of these stories. And on a widespread scale, it meets the definition of genocide. This is um, a story from the, from the New Yorker, Sarah Still, Stillman wrote about this uh, five-year-old girl. Put the picture up of her if you have it. Her name is Helen. She fled Honduras with her grandmother and several other relatives. Gangs had threatened uh, her grandmother's teenage son. And uh, the family no longer felt safe. So uh, the grandmother... Helen's grandmother uh, must have had a couple of kids. One was older, had a teenage son. Um, one was younger, had a five-year-old. Uh, I mean, she had a, a teenage son. Um, and Helen's mother, Jenny, had migrated uh, to Texas four years ago. So the grandmother was planning to seek legal refuge there in Texas. Christian was taken at the border, put into a cage with toddlers. It's a teenage son. Um, a plainclothes official told her that she and Helen would be separated. Now, according to the way they classify five-year-old girls like this who come in with their grandmother, they are unaccompanied minors because they're not coming in with their mom or their dad. And even 
when they separated the kid from the parents, then they become unaccompanied minors. So the word unaccompanied means nothing in this context. So later that day, the, the grandmother and her, her teenage son were reunited. Um, they were released on bail with uh, electronic bracelets pending court, court dates. Maybe not bail, just with the electronic bracelets. They went to see Jenny, the mother, Helen's mother, the five-year-old's mother, with the belief that Helen had been released to the mother. When they got there, she wasn't. Officials from the Office of Refugee uh, Resettlement said that they were holding Helen at a shelter in Houston. And <clears throat> she had been taken to a, um, a Christian Child and Family Services, which had been uh, contracted to house unaccompanied minors. So under the Flores settlement, which was fashioned, um, I believe this took place in the 90s, the Flores settlement, which basically was a function of a lawsuit, private civil lawsuit brought against the government about holding uh, children. Helen, this is the five-year-old, had a right to a bond hearing before a judge. And a hearing like that, she obviously, uh, she, she gets bond, she gets sent, uh, sent, she gets released to her family. Um, at the time that Helen was apprehended, she checks the box on the line that read, I do request an immigration judge. I don't know why they let five-year-olds do this when they've got a guardian with them, but if they, they perceive them as unaccompanied minors, that's what they do. By August, an unknown official handed Helen a five-year-old girl, doesn't matter what her sex is, five-year-old, a legal document that says a request for a Flores bond hearing. That is a bond hearing under the, uh, the auspices of the Flores Agreement, which describes a set of legal proceedings and rights that would have been difficult for Helen to comprehend because she was five. It says, to fully understand a Flores bond hearing, you may speak to an attorney before making a request. If you'd like to speak to an attorney, please inform staff at this facility who will put you in touch with an attorney free of charge, or you may speak to your own attorney if you have one. If you requested a Flores bond hearing but wish to withdraw your request, you may also use this form to withdraw, withdraw your request. One says a box that says, I request a Flores bond hearing at this time. She obviously checked off the first box when she was with her grandmother, who said, check off this box. The second box says, I withdraw my previous request for a Flores bond, uh, bond hearing. I understand that I may request the Flores bond hearing at a later time, and I may do so by filing a new request form or by making an oral request in the immigration court. Child's name, Helen. Child's signature, Helen. Now, Saul is five. He can sign his name. He's been able to write his name for about, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, since he was like a late, late fours. If I was to ask Saul, do you know what it means that you want to uh, request a Flores bond hearing? Saul, incidentally, is an English speaker. That's the first language he speaks. Uh, he was just looking at me and he's like, like flowers? I mean, like with the ears? I don't know. Maybe I'll do it with him. On Helen's form, which f was filled out with assistance from officials, there's a checkbox next to that line. I withdraw my previous request for a Flores bond hearing. And then, of course, she uh, signs her name in the uh, cute little way that uh, five-year-olds were. Her penmanship is actually pretty good uh, for a five-year-old. Um, she keeps it all in one straight line. That's pretty good. Um, she, her N is a capital N. Uh, the rest of the letters seem to be uh, lowercase, except for the H. Um, she was separated from her family for what appears to be like two or three months. Um, and, of course, it changed her personality. 
she was hiding under uh, tables and, and whatnot, fearful. Uh, even when she, she finally uh, met her mom and uh, saw her grandmother again. Um, this is our tax dollars at work. God. And some kids don't get reunited with their there parents. There are still, I think, about 100 kids who yeah. they have uh, yet to uh, be, be able to locate. I read one horrifying story that actually comes from the Obama years of a girl who was taken away from her mom on the grounds that she was neglectful to bring her into the country illegally and adopted out and she never got her back. Yeah, there's I think there's many uh, stories like this uh, under my understanding is under the Obama administration to the extent that they um, would separate any children from parents. It was a function of there had to be an underlying uh, reason there had to be some charge that either they were involved in you know a drug running or there had been reasons to believe that there was abuse or whatnot um, I don't know that that chart my understanding is that charge was not um, if that is the case uh, the policy of just simply separating them at day one um, without any underlying uh, causation for that there wasn't in this case I can dig it up for you yeah the send it but in this instance, this was a mass policy that did this to thousands of children. And above and beyond the policy of we're going to separate you because your, uh, your dad was also uh, you know, uh, running drugs or uh, was involved in some other, or there's some uh, you know, reason for, to believe there was abuse. Now, the Obama administration did run afoul of the Flores Agreement in that they were detaining families for an extended period of time. And you can't do that if there's children that can't, you can't detain them all simultaneously, it, even you know, for an extended period of time. Then ultimately you need to uh, release them on bail. But as a policy, um, this is what has been taking place under the uh, Trump administration. Let's go to the phones. Call him from uh, 865 Area Code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, Sam, this is Kenneth. Kenneth? Where are you calling from, Kenneth? Uh, Knoxville. Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. What's on your mind? Well, uh, quite a bit, and I don't want to unpack all of it, so I don't get to call in often because of my job, but I'm having such problems with conservatives because it's pretty obvious they've got real... Uh, and see it, uh, cognitive dis, uh, disassociation with uh, the facts. It's almost like they always seem to subscribe to like a cult of thinking, a cult of personality. And uh, well, anyway, so whenever I point out any issue to them, like they'll point out the shooting, the Democrat, they, they, they call the Democrats terrorists because of the attack at the baseball game. And, uh, you know, they point to these these things that seem to be repeated through our local our new local radio conservative talk radio is like star T tennessee and it just seems to recirculate those same ideas but whenever you point to things like ann coulter calling for civil war if donald trump isn't elected and things like that they will they dismiss it so it, it almost gets to be almost like a a jim jones cult of personality thing where they only listen to this one voice, and it's it's really it's really bizarre. But um, the the other things I want to point to real quick and let you know, whenever I watch YouTube and your show comes on, and I'm going to start subscribing to you guys because I really like. I mean, I really enjoy your TV in lieu of John Stewart, which um, like Michael, he's got me. I, I can't watch the news without somebody like Michael always adds in a what the fuck moment. And I enjoy that now, so I gotta I gotta add that in. And somebody go, what the fuck is this? So, but uh, at any rate, nice. any rate. Uh, but the point I wanted to make was uh, CRTV is always advertising right before your program. You know, and so I can always. Hmm? Yeah, you know uh, that's a good point, and uh, we have decided that we're actually going to uh, deal with that. I mean, we're going to roll something out in the uh, very near future to to address that because, frankly, the um, uh, we're I, I, we're done seeding that playing field to uh, to conservatives. You know, we had this same thing with um, 
whatever Prager University uh, for a while. And uh, I'm done with that. I'm done. You know, too many of them, uh, they refuse to uh, show up for debates. Uh, they chicken out. So uh, we're going to we will roll out uh, very shortly a, uh, a response to that. But go ahead. Continue. Oh, well, uh, didn't you uh, debate Charlie Kirk? Uh, I'm going to do that at Politicon um, a week from uh, Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be out okay, there great. Sunday night. I assume uh, that'll be a video. Welcome to the forum, Charlie. Exactly. But, um, you know, there were um, he was not he was not the first um, planned person. Let's put it that way. And um, so, uh, you know, and there's others obviously out there. Um, and uh, we, we're going to address that. But um, I appreciate the call. Oh, uh, can I, just uh, one more thing. I sure. really appreciate your show uh, more over than others now because, you know, I learn something new every time I hear uh, your perspective on policy, and I think that's very, very important. I, I get the same from uh, Cody Johnston. Uh, that's uh, another – like, some more news. Yeah, yeah, he really gives uh, – what, what's useful for all that is, you know, there's opinion, but then you need – facts i mean honestly and i know they uh, I, I i get so frustrated with them because when you point to things oh i did have one question for michael um and before i get to that uh it was just basically isn't I, I, when i was talking to them it seems like anytime i have a criticism of of capitalism they always seem to push back with uh these weird uh weird concepts like well we're free market economics but then i point to the fact well if that were true, then people could go in Texas could go to Mexico and buy cheap, cheaper drugs, or they could go from New York to Canada for cheap, cheaper drugs. So we really don't have uh, the option for for our markets for cheaper. We're in a closed market, and then it seems as if the corporations can just go wherever labor's cheap, like Vietnam or somewhere like that. So yeah, whenever There's freedom I, of movement I for capital, these, not people. Yeah, exactly, and and they it's it just. It, they, they, they again, they borrow from tired points of view, like uh, uh, the old Milton Friedman. But I point to Mark Blythe and the yep. Michael Hudson yep. uh, for a great deal of that, and it, it's really, really good to have again that, that argument to, to build off of. So, uh, thanks a lot, you guys. I will join Patreon. I just got a few, you know, financial things to take care of. But I'll, I'll be glad to because right, I, well, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Well, thanks. Kenneth, let me tell you this: if you um if, you, if you'd like a membership and you have uh, um, uh, financial issues, send us an email. We, uh, we will turn no one away. Appreciate the call. Well, thank you. Thanks. Have a good day. Uh, calling from an 814 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is James, and I'm calling from Erie, Pennsylvania. Hello, James. What's on your mind? I'm calling about an earlier Yes, and I thought they made some statements that were prejudicial and offensive. And it was about uh, omnivores lacking in compassion. Okay. And I just want to say there is no kill feed diet that vegetarians pay farmers to kill worms and insects and rodents for them. It's, you know... I, I moved out to the country, and, uh, you know, I've been a vegetarian before, but I think because people are so estranged from where their food's grown, they don't realize that land gets cleared, animals get killed, and it's a whole process of killing animals that allow people to eat their vegetables. And so the idea that they're more compassionate than Omnivores is uh, not doesn't make sense. Well, okay. well wait a second. Case I'm going to go get a cheeseburger. Wait a second, Goodbye. Wait a have a, wait a have a wait nice a weekend, everybody. Listen, I'm going to have a double bacon listen, cheeseburger. I, I, I as as an omnivore myself, um, I think it's 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 a hard it's a hard thing to argue that um, killing less animals, factory farming less animals, is not slightly more compassionate than the idea of yes you got to kill insects uh and occasionally if you got a groundhog suffering here. if you got a groundhog that is coming in and eating a lot of your foods i guess maybe they shoot the groundhog or something like that 
I mean, I see what you're saying. You well, told me you killed groundhogs for take, sports. Yeah. Let's take his utilitarian argument at face value, okay? Say the lives of insects and groundhogs, yada, yada, are a thing he actually cares about. The amount of... Well, he's not saying that he cares about them. Or, he's or that, that we care about. The amount of veggies that it takes to create any amount of meat is like 10 times what it would be if you just ate the veggies. So even if you care about that utilitarian argument, it's still more compassionate to be a vegetarian. But then well, you wouldn't be saying, swole. He's saying that it's impossible to be... No, well, let me ask you this. I mean, James, do you think it's even possible to be compassionate about any? Like, in other words, do you think... Let me put it this way. Do you think it's hypocritical for me to say, like, hey, man, I feel bad for that person who was uh, murdered by me shooting a gun at them when I don't really, but it doesn't bother me because I pay taxes and uh, we kill people abroad. Like, I mean, there's a difference, right? I mean, isn't there? Like I could say like, hey, I, I think it's wrong for you to shoot that person, but I don't necessarily am not as upset about paying taxes for uh, weapons that kill people, right? I don't know. You kind of lost me there, but all well, I'm but you're saying, saying uh, let me let me. All right, well, James, if I lost, have, let, me, let me restate it because I was unclear. If you're saying that you that it's hypocritical to have compassion for, let's say, pigs that may be slaughtered in factory farms, and that you shouldn't eat those because of that. If you say that it's it's hypocritical because when you eat your uh, bok choy, let's say. Um, in fact, a farmer ends up killing a bunch of insects and maybe some uh, rodents as well. Um, if you don't see a distinction between those, um, do you see a distinction between, um, you know, you murdering somebody versus you paying taxes uh, that go to a war machine that end up killing people? What I'm saying is it's possible for omnivores to be just as compassionate as vegetarians and that your diet has nothing to do with it. Well, I mean, not in terms of, you know, uh, not in terms of, of like the pigs, right? <laughs> the cows. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm not a come on, vegan, man. but worm suffering doesn't mean the same thing as well, cow suffering. By the way, like wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. Also, also, if you were really just going purely on compassion, by the logic of your argument, and I hate to be a by your by logic your person, logic. by your logic, you'd be a Jane who wear face masks so as to not even swallow insects by accident. And some of whom literally follow, they only eat fruit and nuts because they fall from trees. They don't, they're not picked. Some studies show that even plants, apparently, I have no idea you measured this, have some sense of a reaction when they know they're going to get picked. So if you're following... But he's not... But no, he's I not, get that, but, but he, I'm saying... But he's not making a claim about himself. I he's saying that... No, it's ridiculous. But, but, but on here's his face, you have less compassion I can for make it even simpler than that. Them. I can yes, even make it simpler than that. Of course you have less compassion for if them. If you have compassion for 10 people versus someone who has compassion for six people, that person who has compassion for 10 people has more compassion. And <laughs> is that not right, James? No, I mean, when you get- Is that not right, James? Like James, is that, is, James, versus, no, James listen, is that not right? No, listen, you're clearing land in order to grow I, vegetables. I agree, I agree. Yeah, and like I, agree. I Hold said- Hold on, let me finish, hold on. Oh, James, just answer the question. Is what I said correct? No, I don't think so. so. I don't think a person who who has compassion for 99 people and someone else has compassion for 100 people that the 99 person is less compassionate than the 100 person. Well, Maybe okay, the, then you know, the word more or less compassion means nothing. In which case, all right, then you're right. <laughs> Words have no meaning, and there is no know. way to measure I compassion. I don't think it's based on no, James, a, a James. numbers of things. Oh, it's not? What is it based on? The past three o'clock. What's it based on? <laughs> Some it, compassion it, it, for it, us. It, 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 compassion. Well, stop interrupting me, and we can get this over with. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm just curious. How do you, can you measure compassion? I, I can't. 
Okay. Personally, but I know right. people can have compassion. All right, but James, if we can't measure then compassion, then what are you worried about? Just, you could have just called in no, and say, listen, compassion okay, is impossible to measure, therefore for it's impossible for someone to have more if compassion person, than less. And if it's impossible to measure, okay, fine. Appreciate the call. <laughs> wow. I was about to sit here and be like, right, interrupt you. You're going to go for another 35 minutes. I'm no, sorry. I mean. You know what? Maybe if, because if it you, involved animals, not economics. If but if that was a libertarian caller, we would be here till 430. That is absolutely true. But if you cannot measure compassion, then yes, it is a mistake to say one person's more compassionate than another. But if you can, and look, I, I, I will readily admit I do not have enough compassion to stop eating meat. Well, it's just so easy to understand a scale of suffering. Like the and implications of killing a cow versus a mosquito in terms of their sentient experience. I mean, come on, man. Don't be a fucking idiot. And as if and suffering, don't take everything so personally. Suffering's not the only metric either. Climate is probably the more if, if I'm gonna go right, if right, I'm gonna right. cut meat. But now he was taking just, issue with the with the, the, the that that No, he was talking about compassion. Matthew said that he had more compassion now. Four four legged animals because he has one, mm. and would, that's all. That's I would probably it. move you know, beyond that as pedantry, but whatever. Uh, I've heard every single one of these arguments from defensive, disingenuous carnivores. Okay, I'm ready. Don't come at me. With, and, you're not going to get anything that I haven't heard before. I am a completely genuine uh, omnivore, and uh, and and even I, I realize like that. It just means that I have, on some level, fundamentally a lack of compassion for these animals. Uh, if I had more compassion... Uh, Sorry, Mr. Pig. Sorry, Mr. Cow. I, mean, I, I eat you all. I'm trying to cut back. <laughs> I'm trying to cut back for one, once a day. Uh, pigs are... Uh, at the satellite apartment. Right. Pigs are as smart as dogs. Folks, yes. we have... Uh, 15 people on the line. I I'm never eat sorry. Pigs. I gotta uh, go in a second. I need to show a certain lack of compassion for you as callers. Well, that's, and makes that sense. is the end. Ooh, We're gonna do nice, uh, five nice. IMs. And uh, oh, we didn't even get to the Kanye stuff. I feel like everybody has seen it. It's already I don't know. overdone. Uh, Vic Berger got a text from his dad saying, uh, maybe leave the Kanye stuff because he's clearly mentally ill. And that's sort of where he I'm is at. mentally ill. It's not a secret. He's he has yeah, bipolar public, disorder. Yeah. Well, that so was it. That he's was been it. hospitalized. It's still funny. This, is, this is my only comment about the about the Kanye thing. I mean, I've watched it. It's crazy um, to watch the thing. It's also pretty crazy. It's more of a reflection on Trump who is exploiting this guy and sitting there nodding his head like, yeah, I get what you're saying and this and that. But it is not, I, I do not feel uh, equipped to make an assessment, a clinical assessment. We make colloquial assessments of people all the time. They're crazy, they're lunatics, this and that. But in terms of a clinical assessment, I don't have the ability to do this. But I do know that he has said that he has been <laughs> diagnosed, presumably by a professional who had the ability to prescribe medication because he's also on record as saying he stopped taking his medication. So he is at the very least uh, someone who has been diagnosed with um, uh, uh, mental, emotional dis issues, enough so that a doctor has prescribed uh, medication for him, and he made a conscious decision to go off those, uh, those pills. Uh, a public decision, apparently, I don't know him personally, so it must oh, almost really? definitely public. Does he know uh, Sarah? And I don't. <laughs> but, um, and uh, the president is trying to, um, I don't know, build some type of political movement on it. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Let me tell you this. It's embarrassing for any conservative who is trying to make an argument Broadly, that people are following their, uh, that are moving to their side because of what Kanye has said. It is particularly embarrassing to say that African Americans are finally seeing the light because this guy who yes. publicly announced that he's off his medication has decided to take a meeting with the president. All right. That, if you, if that is your argument about how people are coming to subscribe to your ideology, um, That's a super look, good take And I will say person. this coming Tuesday on TMBS Where you're going to play absolutely every single Kanye <laughs> clip available And oh uh, we are going to have A 
very. I'm not saying I'm going to play good the clip time. tomorrow. But Matt, Matt I mean, said Monday, Matt, but Matt was see. sending me clips. I All said, right. Matt, you're a smart cookie. Look, he got it. It could be both, right? <laughs> Because there are plenty of people who are mentally ill who don't spout horrible political opinions, right? So that's partly on him, and it's partly on the fact that, yes, he is having Well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have someone who has mental illness and come into your uh, office or, uh, you know, uh, be in your... I- I'm not convinced everybody in that room doesn't have some type of mental issue, Like, it's frankly. a combination. That's but all I'm trying to say. It's only no, no because it's only one saying. thing. If he was saying perfectly sensible things, no one would be caring. He actually didn't really. He said some pretty cool stuff. I, didn't I mean, part of it. it is the mental illness and part of it is him being an asshole. It can be both. But that's right. what makes the mental illness relevant. Whatever. Right, let's go to uh, JJ. TMBS, cool. Kanye. Uh, the left really needs us to fight hard because the Dems take power in 2020 and don't manage to overcome a lot of the Republican hate agenda. A further extreme right could come back worse. Indeed. A square. Uh, finally, Digby gets a theme song. Matthew, film guy, I love Snow Purser and I love Tilda's acting, so I'll watch. Murphy uh, should be House Leader if Dems get the uh, Senate. He was on Hayes and Chris Murphy. And when asked basically if any doubt that Khashoggi was killed, he looked straight in the camera and said, no, he's been one of the senators with the greatest clarity of purpose. Merkley is floating that he may run for president, incidentally. I'm not opposed to that, but they got to get out the way Tom. for Bernie. Uh, yesterday, when I called into the show, everyone comments called me a cuck and a troll because I mentioned being a member of Young Democrats at my college. FYI, some friends and I are currently in the process of establishing a Dem Socialist. Why would you? Yeah, don't that. feel bad about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, don't feel good, bad good about for you. that. You're comments. doing work. People yeah. just big idiots. Left Prince Ve- Vegeta, I am the prince of all salians again. Left is best. Keen observer could uh, totally see Michael hanging out. Barnes and Noble, as per usual, getting triggered by the coming insurrection. Uh, but like in a smart way, so problematic. Rob Cole, I thought about all that build-up. Matthew Film Guy was going to recommend Babe. Have a great weekend. Still uh, from Still Apartheid, Free of Barkley. And the final, I am of the day of the week. Paul Ryan's double uh, federal taxes figure is probably forced on the stipulation that he gets his Ayn Rand and spend wet dream and reduces taxes to zero for the rich and cor- corporations. Double that figure is only enough to pay for anything Ryan's government, health care, and endless war. See you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive between the 101 and the 5 do you know how far the detour takes you yeah I know the clock is ticking but the meds are gonna kick Shifted it.